All right, so we're going to start off this, uh, this meeting with the, the general session, which is Advanced Technologies in Marine Science. And uh, I think Dave Donaldson is going to give an introduction to that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, appreciate uh, everyone uh, coming to uh, the Commission's uh, 70th, 70th uh, spring meeting, and welcome to uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama. Uh, Alabama is, has been uh, gracious enough to have us uh, ho host the meeting and have us here on the beach. It's a beautiful location. Uh, so the purpose of these general sessions is to, is to provide a forum uh, to discuss important issues uh, related to Gulf, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, we recently, I think this is our second time where we've in actually incorporated it into, a, into the TCC, um, which is our, the scientific arm of the commission. Uh, we've addressed a variety of issues from, from uh, economics to mercury to oil spill science, uh, harmful algal blooms, uh, recreational fisheries, turtles, and, and aquaculture. So uh, as, as the chairman uh, mentioned, this, this session will be looking at various tech technologies including drones, uh, acoustic and satellite tags, uh, remote uh, underwater vehicles, uh, acoustics, towed cameras, and, and uh, artificial intelligence for fish ID and, and, and habitat. So uh, the, the, we have a variety of presenters that uh, will be talking about these new technologies and how, how the gathered data can be used uh, for better uh, fisheries management. So thanks again for attending and, and enjoy the proceedings. and. Uh, we, I will uh, uh, introduce Brian Conan, uh, who's going to talk about uh, sail drones. I believe he's online, Joe. So uh, we will uh, move right into it. So thanks. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. Sorry I'm not there in person. Uh, USM has uh, ordered uh, some social distancing, uh, so we're not allowed to travel domestically uh, at, the, at this point, or I would have been over there. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about today are a project that we have with sail drone uh, involving remote ocean mapping, and this was funded under a NOAA grant uh, through the Office of Coast Survey to see if sail drones could be used with a multi-beam sonar to conduct you know, high-resolution mapping in remote areas like the Arctic or out in the Western Pacific where they need information. And then I've got a few slides that I asked sail drone to send me on other projects that they've done related to fisheries uh, that I think will be of interest to you all. So um, as way of introduction, I'm the director of the Hydrographic Science Research Center for Southern Miss. I'm located out at Stennis Space Center. Uh, my background, I, I was 28 years in the Navy as a naval oceanographer and hydrographer uh, and started this job about 18 months ago. Uh, those of you may have known uh, Rear Admiral Ken Barber, he had this position before I did. So a little bit about what a sail drone is. You may be familiar with them, but they're a, about a seven meter uh, wind propelled and solar power drone. You see the picture there, and that's actually the one that we're using. Uh, you see the dual GPS antennas on board. Uh, this was an early configuration that we had. Um, one thing to remember is you don't actually buy the sail drone. You buy the service, and so you work with sail drone on what sensors you want on board, and then they provide uh, a mission portal online that you can go in and see your data, see your sail drone run around, and if you want to make changes, you communicate through that mission portal to their operations center. Uh, to basically, uh, you know, drive it where you want it to or make any, any changes on the fly. Now, as you can see, there's not uh, a lot of space there. Um, you see the solar panels, and we'll talk a little bit about the power management on board and, and how that was important for us. Um, but again, our goal and objective was to see, hey, could what kind of data can we collect with these, and, and what kind of a con-ups would we be able to come up with? So here's a kind of a close-up of the sail drone out of the waters. We're getting ready to lift it in. So you can see on the bulb keel there, right on the bottom, uh, that is where we installed the multi-beam. We used a, a Norbit uh, high-resolution multi-beam. Um, see the twin antennas. It had an integrated inertial navigation system. Uh, so you had a very uh, tight connection between the motions of the boat, uh, and the soundings on the floor, and the GPS position. So a uh, very uh, good system. And we've used this outside of a sail drone before with no problems. Uh, so we fully expected to get good data from this, assuming that a sail drone was actually a stable platform and could run survey lines. So the first part was to integrate the multi-beam and get it out into uh, the water. So we ran a couple of missions down here in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, you can kind of see the area we went to. Um, so for hydrographic survey and ocean mapping, 
you really want to run straight survey lines that overlap so that you get full bottom coverage. Uh, so we were working on the control of the sail drone and what their tolerances were for maintaining line. Uh, you see a few lines in there that are very jagged. Uh, that is, it's a sailboat, so it had to tack, it keep tacking to remain on the on the line we were trying to do. So a lot of this also involves the sail drone folks forecasting the winds and shifts um, and then adjusting uh, the track of the sail drone uh, to make sure it can still do what it needs to do uh, with the changing wind conditions. So just kind of click through, you see a couple of wrecks here uh, that we had in our survey area. Next, um, if you look closely, we found them exactly where they were supposed to be, so that was good. Um, and so the charts are good and uh, the sail drone was working well with the multi-beam. Um, but we also found one wreck that wasn't on the chart, a small trawler on the bottom in about 20 meters of water. And you can see the profile in the in the bottom there of the resolution that we can get with this sonar, especially in shallow water. So uh, this is without any corrections applied for uh, tides or, uh, or actually cleaning any of the data and pulling out outliers. So we are very pleased with this performance. So phase two, uh, one of the things that we do when we run a multi-beam sonar is we require the sound velocity to be measured fairly frequently. Um, there just wasn't enough power on board the sail drone to run both a multi-beam and a, a small winch. So we put another sail drone with a small winch to lower a sound velocity probe. And they ran missions out around San Francisco. Um, the sound velocity measurement system went really well. It's got about 100 meters of cable on it and it was able to lower and raise and get down to about 95 meters on its longest cast. That's a picture of it there uh, with uh, NOAA ship uh, waiting in the background, um, not waiting or near, in the background in San Francisco. Uh, you can see the data that was collected there. So in the upper left, you see the sound velocity profile, and then that was the uh, high resolution multi-beam that was collected. And when overlaid and checked against the existing NOAA data, uh, this bathymetry was within uh, 10 centimeters of that of that data. So we're, we're very confident that we can collect good data uh, with this system. Now, the lessons learned. So uh, autonomy versus unmanned. This is not an autonomous system. It is an unmanned and monitored system. Um, so it's not going to make decisions that humans have not programmed into it. Um, power. So we ran in July in the Gulf of Mexico for eight days straight. So surveying 24-7. And when it got back uh, to to the pier, it had about 10% of its battery power left. So we've been working with both the multi beam manufacturer and sail drone into how to make the system more efficient. Uh, can we get 30 days uh, of, of power out of the existing system or do we need to add you know, better solar panels, more batteries, hydro generators, those types of things? And that's what we'll be working on this, uh, this year is what's the optimum configuration for these. Uh, the second, or sorry, the third piece was communications. Uh, these all run with a very small Iridium satellite connection. And so you can get back uh, basic MedOcean data uh, that, it, that it has sensors for, uh, you know, very textual in its location. But we, what we really need as hydrographers is we need that coverage map of, of what it is seeing on the bottom. And so we're also working there with the manufacturers to uh, allow us to see both health and status of the multi-beam as well as to look at the, the coverage that's being collected and then to make adjustments and to decide if we need to take another sound velocity cast, uh, do we need to shift lines, um, is there a wreck uh, or some other in object of interest on the bottom that we want to go take a closer look at, those types of things. So that goes into that sensor integration control. Um, you know, the, the C2, the command and control system of the sail drone, uh, being able to talk to the sensors you have on board. Uh, We've made one big step there in that our multi-beam is now has a ability to run within a Linux operating system, which is what SailDrone uses, and that makes communications a whole lot easier. It also allows us to shut down a lot of uh, Microsoft things running in the background that don't need to be running but take power. Uh, the data quality we were very happy with, um, so we saw no issues there. Uh, one thing we, you know, we learned, of course, uh, we should have just thought of this, but when we're doing hydrographic surveys with manned systems, we pull them out of the water every day. Uh, so this is the result of leaving it in the water for about 40 days in the summer in the Gulf of Mexico um, and realizing that, hey, 
you know, we, that's something we'll have to consider uh, as well for anti-fouling coding, those types of things. Um, you saw how the children looks, it gets shipped around on a, on a kind of a flatbed truck. Um, so that's from a logistics standpoint, you need to have a crane to get it in the water, but otherwise it's really easy to put together uh, and you can be launched really from anywhere that you can get a, you know, lift a crane into the water and tie it up to a, a pier. So for our next uh, next phase this year is we're going to send both the uh, the surveyor and the profiler out together again around San Francisco, and as I talked about, we're going to focus on that power management and developing a conops for how this could be used. Um, you know, maybe it is uh, collect data for for two weeks and then shut down for two days to to recharge and then pick up surveying again, and we'll make our final evaluation and our recommendations to NOAA. Uh, again, this is Office Go Survey. Uh, NOAA Fisheries has been using these uh, already, and I'll talk a little bit about those. But uh, again, you know, this is a real strain on the on the low power of this system, but uh, it does show some potential. So again, just uh, these are sail drone uh, company slides, corporate slides. I asked them to send me so we could uh, kind of uh, show where the sail drones have worked. You can kind of see around the U.S. where they've worked. Um, they've also circumnavigated Antarctica. And just the other day, uh, they had two that sailed across the Atlantic through the Straits of Gibraltar and into the Mediterranean um, to do some work in the Mediterranean. So initially, you know, fairly basic mid-ocean sensors. They've been adding more and more sensors, and I'll talk about a few of those. Um, you know, just things that if, if you wanted to have a, a long-duration movable uh, system at sea, uh, these these can fit the bill. Now I will also say that they're building a much larger sail drone with uh, surveying capability. It's going to be a 20, I want to say a 27 meter vessel um, that's going to operate uh, initially in the Caribbean to do some mapping in the EEZ of the Cayman Islands, and it's going to actually have a diesel generator on board. It's have plenty of power, but that's going to be a fully, you know. Uh, it has to be Coast Guard compliant, has to do collision avoidance, all those things. These sail drones, are, the Coast Guard doesn't worry about them because they're fairly small. Uh, if they get hit and run over, it's not going to hurt uh, whatever they've run into. So, again, you'll see more of these and bigger ones. They're, they're planning to at least build three of the bigger ones and uh, kind of focus their efforts on the seabed 2030 ocean mapping uh, efforts there. Um, so, Kind of first here is looking at acoustics and what they are able to do with that. Uh, you can see the the Pollock schools. Um, you know the the interesting thing here is you know, this is also a, a very quiet system, right? It's it's sail and solar, so you you're not really putting any mechanical uh, noise into the water that might uh, affect you know the fish that you're looking at, and they've kind of shown that here with uh, with that. So. Uh, they were able to measure these Pollock schools using uh, the system on board. They had a Simrad uh, echo sounder and, uh, and take those for, again, for NOAA. Um, you can see they've been doing surveys in the Arctic, um, not only the, the Pollock survey, but also you can see the picture there from the ice edge. Uh, so you do get pictures back from these sail drones. So that's a pretty good one there with the uh, with it kind of hitting the ice edge, uh, but being able to go up and, and kind of poke its way along the ice edge and provide some instruments to calibrate NASA satellites that are flying over so we can better measure the extent of the ice uh, and get the thickness of the ice and other conditions that are important for uh, for ice modelers. Um, again, uh, just another example of doing NOAA fishery coverage out in the on the west coast. Um, you know. You see their their point there of covering the entire coast in 60 days. So, of course, this is a wind-dependent system. However, they're very efficient. Uh, the owner of Saildrone, uh, the founder of Saildrone, he got his start in sailing uh, cars out in the um, salt flats, and he you know was setting land speed records with these kind of rigid uh, sails that these have, and uh, then kind of turned them over into the Saildrone. So, uh, pretty interesting place to go visit as well. I walked in and I looked around and I immediately said, so you hire sailors, surfers, and engineers? And he said, yes, because there were people who were you know, working on sails, people who were sanding uh, fiberglass, and then folks uh, soldering electronic boards in another room. But uh, really, it's an old naval aviation hangar out in Alameda. It's just full of these things. It's, uh, if you get a chance to, to see it out there, it's pretty nice. 
Um, you can also, um, they've used these to go around with the, as you can see, this, the fur seals here that are all satellite tagged, and then you can, um, you know, kind of follow those around with the sail drone and take measurements and to uh, look at what the behaviors are with these as they do their uh, their feeding um, throughout that, uh, I guess they did 70 days there. So um, pretty interesting concept. Go ahead, I think this one also shows um, being able to track uh, king crabs with acoustic trackers. So you can see the circles that are around it. So being able to uh, kind of follow around the, the king crab populations and see what they're doing with a uh, a nice movable, uh, fairly inexpensive unmanned uh, system on the surface that can talk back to you uh, while the, while it's doing. So, um, nope, one more, sorry. They're also doing uh, whale tracking. So um, I think the, the purpose here was they were able to look at killer whales and, and right whales. Um, and again, you've got a quiet system in their uh, habitats and uh, were able to compare what they were seeing against uh, moorings in there and, and they got good comparisons. So I think it's, um, you know, again, they're still learning some of these on the best way to use these sail drones for these animal tracking exercises, uh, but certainly is uh, is moving ahead. All right, that's kind of what I had. I'm happy to take any questions. And, and again, um, I was having trouble hearing about half the room, I think. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, make sure I can I can hear in the microphone or, or send it to me on the chat. My contact info is there. If anybody's got a question, why don't you just drop me an email or give me a call. I'm happy to answer any questions after that, after this. Um, so at any point, just send me those questions and I'll get back to you. All right, thanks. Okay, the, uh, the next person we have is Dr. Kevin Boswell from Florida International University, and he's going to be talking to us about fisheries acoustics. Perfect. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me, and uh, appreciate the uh, the opportunity to come here and, and talk a little bit about uh, what we're doing with acoustics. So um, <clears throat> the the intent here is to kind of provide a, a broad overview of some of the things that we've been doing with with active acoustics, uh, and in particular its application to. It seems really loud. Is that is that too loud? No. Oh, okay. Um, application to uh, to reef fish. Um, or, or reef fishes in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and so I'll take this opportunity really to, to try to fill information gaps if possible. Um, give an overview of some of the things that we've done to try to uh, address fishery independent surveys, but then also highlight opportunities where we think we can, we can make progress or, or enhance the ability to use acoustics um, in these systems. All right, so like most, probably, the, um, the primary drivers that, that we're really focused on is trying to get some information on distributional dynamics, understanding how fish are associated with habitats that they occupy, and then, in some cases, understanding their behavior, the interactions between or among, uh, among species. Um, and you can imagine, like you've just seen, uh, technology can play a really important role here. Um, and, and in the case of my lab, uh, which is focused on, on developing technological um, capabilities, um, you're constantly keeping up with the pace, if you will, uh, trying to develop new, new opportunities and, and new um, techniques or methods. And so hopefully you'll, you'll get a little bit of, of that throughout this talk. Um, and, and I want to point out that, if I can get this right, this bottom, there we go. So this piece right here is really important, I think. So not only developing tools, but being able to assimilate the information that comes from these tools. And it's going to, of course, span many, many scales, both spatial and temporal. And hopefully you'll, you'll see that as we go forward. All right, so observation, of course, is key to all of this. And you can imagine that in the conditions that we tend to find ourselves in in the Gulf, um, there's a, an array of, of options. Um, so we can go from high sediment load areas, uh, riverine, estuarine, right, where you can't see your hand in front of your face, to beautiful coral reef systems where water clarity is fantastic. 
except when they turn out the lights, right? So at nighttime, you can't see anything. And so optical systems or, or cameras or things like that, they're not terribly effective, or they're not as efficient. And, and the great thing about acoustics is it has the ability to work generally fairly well in all of those conditions. And so it can serve as a baseline uh, technology or technique that we can acquire quantitative information uh, across an, an array of, of habitat or, or environmental conditions. Um, and so just, just broadly, it's, it's accepted worldwide as a tool or technique to quantify, in our case, fish across an array of ecosystems or habitats. Uh, many benefits exist, as shown here, um, but there are some important challenges, and, and those are the things that I'm going to try to focus on today. Um, it's easy to go turn on a fish finder, drive around in circles, and, and measure stuff, but interpreting what you're measuring is the part that's really important. And so we in the Gulf of Mexico, I think, have, have an opportunity to try to take some time and, and try to develop this a little bit further. So just to orient you to this, um, for those that aren't familiar, um, there are two different types of systems that we have. So this is an imaging system. Uh, it looks like a sonogram, if you will. Uh, and so it provides an image, right? It's very easy to interpret what you're seeing. Uh, in this case, it's Menhaden and being chased by a barracuda. Uh, and so you can see here the static parts of the image. That's the substrate. This is range away from it. And so this is out to about eight meters or so. And so it's very clear to interpret what you're seeing. There's an interaction between the predator and prey. Um, the other side of this is the standard sort of fish finder echogram, right? Where you see um, hard reflector, which is the bottom. You see things through the water column. If you're looking downward, this represents, of course, fish. There's substrate or some sort of structure. And then you can other, see other things that are distributed through the water column, which we um, identify generally as plankton or small scatters. Things that we're, we tend to really be interested in are, are fish, right? And so you have these two types of options. And you can integrate these in different ways. Um, and I'll, I'll focus most of the talk on the active acoustics part. Uh, it's the one that seems to be most uh, conventionally used uh, in our system. All right, so um, active acoustics has been used across uh, an array of, of systems and, and for uh, uh, specific questions uh, related to organisms that aggregate. So a lot of the work that my lab does focuses on aggregations. So here's a few examples of where acoustics has been used in our region um, or uh, here in South, uh, or sorry, Western Australia, which we'll get to at the end of the uh, end of the talk. But it's really easy to to use this when organisms are aggregated. They, you always know where they're at, and the, the the ability to perceive these things works quite well. However, when you're doing larger, broader surveys of trying to understand habitat distribution, the association of organisms uh, across distributed habitats, let's say like across the West Florida Shelf, it's a little bit different, and it takes a somewhat of a different approach. So the majority of this talk will be focused on what we've, what we've done here and, and again, like I mentioned, point out the opportunities for, for improvement. All right, so, whoops, wrong way. Try that again. Okay, so in the West Florida Shelf and, and a lot of the, uh, at least some of the coastal gulf over on that side, uh, we have habitat that looks like this, right? There's, um, there's this beautiful natural looking reef and, and the fun fish that live around it. And then there's these other things that people like to throw in the water, right? We call artificial reef, which we all recognize is important. Um, acoustically, they look quite different, right? And, and interpreting this can be challenging, as you can imagine. Um, the, uh, the idea, though, is that we want to be able to try to, to integrate acoustics with other complementary methods to, to attempt to improve our abilities to to, to quantify these resources. And so this was a project that was funded um, under the first uh, Florida Restore program, the Centers of Excellence, where we are a part of this, uh, myself and uh, Will Patterson. And the idea was to see, can we integrate acoustics with some optical method? In this case, it was ROVs. And so we developed this um, uh, sampling program, which was uh, between Perdido Key and Cape San Blas across a depth gradient, and so we had 48 stations that we occupied twice, or we occupied both in, in two years. And we applied acoustics, so these active acoustics across multiple frequencies, and then uh, ROV imagery, um, one after the other to try to see, well, where do we have comparisons, where do we have strengths, what are the limitations, and um, is it possible to apply these two approaches in a relatively efficient and um, rapid manner uh, and still derive quantitative metrics that are useful. 
And so we would hit up at a site, show up, we'd put in our echo sounder, we would run circles for, uh, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour, and then we'd dump in the ROV, run some transects with the ROV, pick it up and move on to the next station. So we were able to be relatively efficient uh, and do this in about uh, four, well, I guess within a day, maybe five or six stations if, if all went well. And so it can be a rapid way of, of uh, surveying areas across broad scales um, and deriving important quantitative metrics. So here was the framework that, that we based this on, really. And, and so I just wanted to highlight some of the things that we expect to get from acoustics, some of the things we expect to get from uh, our optical or, or our V systems, and try to show where things are directly measurable or where metrics have to be derived through some, uh, some assumptions, if you will. And so I'll just point out to you that the, um, so, uh, where are we at? There we are. So these, these dashed lines are the approximations, and the solid lines are the ones that we, we believe we can measure um, uh, directly from the instrument. And so you can see that there's some overlap, but there's areas in which, again, we need to make some inference or use one to inform another. And at the end of the day, these are the things that we're interested in with respect to management, right? These are the metrics um, or the parameters that are important for fisheries management. And so these are the, the pieces that we're really trying to focus on, and that's what we attempted to develop our study on. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on the study itself, um, other than just to provide some really brief, um, brief results to make you feel a little confident in what I'm trying to tell you, uh, but then I'll move on with what are the, what, where are our opportunities for improvement. So these are the stations that we occupied, um, and so you can see uh, we have shallow and deep systems, we have uh, high and low relief um, in these different areas, and the, the take home message here is to say that if we were to take our acoustic measures, which are here in the top, the, this top graph, um, as a function of either habitat type, so natural or artificial reefs, uh, or depth gradients. You can see that there, there are some patterns. In almost all cases, we see that the artificial reefs tend to have higher densities of fish. No surprise there. Um, with the ROV systems, we saw the exact same thing, really. Uh, so the artificial reefs here consistently had higher fish densities that are estimated relative to the natural reefs. And similar uh, patterns were observed between shallow and, uh, and deeper areas. And so this isn't intended to surprise you, but just to suggest that you know when we take these um, these metrics together, uh, we can really begin to understand the strengths and and potential weaknesses uh, of these systems. So there is a lot of potential um, utility, I think, but here are some room f or some areas for for improvement, and some particular uh, considerations that that came out of this work uh, were three main things. So one, survey design. Survey design. Is Survey design is very important. Um, and insofar as how do you actually survey the area you're interested in. And so I've shown here two, whoops, giving it away, uh, two different types, so parallel versus this uh, sort of flower pattern survey. Ground truthing, understanding what you're actually observing. So the backscatter that you get from your acoustic system, it makes these really pretty pictures on your computer screen, and then you have to interpret what it means. Uh, and then, of course, um, modeling. So Understanding and interpreting the acoustic information can come from a couple different places. It can come from the optics, like I've mentioned, um, but can also come from, from in situ or uh, ex situ observations where you're really trying to understand the acoustic properties of an organism. And this comes through uh, modeling approaches. So survey design, this is, um, this is quite important, particularly if you think that you have a habitat, let's say like this, this blue thing I put in the middle, that's your habitat. Both of these survey designs would do a pretty good job of quantifying things that are associated with the habitat. But if you have organisms that are distributed a bit more broadly, one would be much more appropriate than the other. And these were, uh, these were lessons learned after actually looking at what happened in the field. <laughs> so uh, this is where you're supposed to chuckle. Um, so all best plans, of course, you tell the captain, just drive straight lines, turn around, drive back. It's great. You can do it. Um, and the green squiggly lines represent that attempt. And then the other, of course, was, well, if you can just imagine, you know, these, these, um, these straight lines that, that bisect the reef, turn around, do this nice thing, and, uh, and you can see the result of that, right? So some captains or some vessel operators uh, were a bit better at it than others, but the take-home message is that if, if we're relying on, um, on, on uh, traditional vessels that we have available to us uh, without some of the more advanced uh, 
I guess, autopilot systems. Uh, this may be the result you get. And the, the important part here is that this will directly mediate the answer that you get, right? The, the error associated with the measurement that you've just taken will be greatly inflated. And so this is an important component to keep in mind. All right, so next, ground truthing. Um, so understanding, again, like I said, what you're actually measuring is important. We, of course, don't want to go and do all of this. Um, and so we need to rely on some other uh, options for, for visualizing what we're actually observing, or at least at minimum develop some baselines. And so optics is a great opportunity for this. Um, of course, there's stereo camera options, there's uh, ROVs, and there's baited, uh, stationary baited or unbaited arrays. There's an array of, of, of options for trying to ground truth what you see acoustically. But it is important, and, and it's something that needs to be taken care of and, and considered. Uh, and of course, some of the things that, that we might want to get out of this data include species ID or length estimates, which would be something that we would have to infer from the acoustics. Um, and so it's also nice to have that information provided by a more direct measure. Um, position off the bottom, how far off the bottom are they, and then also understanding the effects of the dead zone. So as you're propagated an acoustic signal down to a, a hard substrate, you're missing pieces. So, oops, some of, um, some of, some of that, the, the biomass that's associated with, with the uh, uh, substrate is, is missed in this, what we call an acoustic dead zone. And so optical systems have a great complementary, um, uh, I, I guess, capability for, for helping to understand those pieces. All right, so target strength um, measurements. And so this is an in situ, ex situ, uh, approach generally. And so target strength represents broadly the acoustic equivalent to fish length or, or the size of an organism. And so there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, others have, have spent significant time and resource to develop these fancy um, uh, probes which have all of the acoustic instruments and cameras and you drop them down and they're free floating and they don't interact with anything. And so they're incredibly non-invasive and provide really great um, coincident measures of acoustics and optics of things that you're trying to measure, which is really great, but this requires significant investment. Um, the poor man's version of this is put a fish in a net, put it down underwater and start pinging away and, you know, ultimately you'll be able to converge your, your measurements. But it's important to understand this, uh, and in particular in the Gulf of Mexico, we don't really have much um, information or background information on the acoustic properties of these organisms. All organisms, uh, and in particular fish with swim bladders, they scatter sound a little bit differently. So understanding this baseline information will really help us to integrate acoustics as a technique that can be more broadly used and appreciated. Um, and so here's an example just to sort of drive this home. Um, this, is a, this is a nice figure that uh, Benoit Bird and Lawson put out a couple years ago in one of their reviews. And this is to illustrate what the acoustic responses look like relative to the different kinds of organisms. Okay, and then these vertical lines that you can see, you probably can't read it from back there, um, those five vertical lines represent the standard sampling frequencies that we would apply with acoustics. So when you go out and you buy your acoustic system, it's going to operate at a certain frequency. In this case, we have an 18 kilohertz, a 38 kilohertz, and so on. And that's what you're going to sample your organism at. And so if you look down those lines, when you look at your echo sounder, that's the data point you're going to get. You're going to get a point from where that line intersects the, the response. Um, so, whoops. So this is the acoustic response across all the different frequencies. So if you took the whole spectrum of frequencies, and then this is the magnitude, that target strength value. And so you can see, let's say for fish with swim bladders, they peak at a much lower frequency than we'd ever measured. And then it flattens out. And so you would get these measurements at that point, at that point, at that point, and so on. And that's what you would be using to compare um, across other organisms or other, um, even maybe trying to discriminate other fishes. And so again, it gets back down to trying to interpret this pattern, right? What are we seeing here? This is a really weird thing. Uh, what are we seeing here in, in this, uh, this echogram and how do they compare across frequencies? And so um, absent of any of that in situ information, there are ways to, to statistically derive Oops, there we go. Ways to, st to stati statistically derive um, uh, length estimates and, and target strength estimates and try to compare them in a statistical framework 
um, where, and we're not going to get into the details of all this, but, but the end of the day is if you have some link distributions that come from some other independent way, uh, let's say optics, and then you have your target strength distributions, we can, we can estimate what this relationship should look like, your length to target strength relationship. Um, and here's an example of, of this being done for Goliath Grouper. So we now have a relationship, a statistically based relationship, but still needs to be ground truth. And that's, again, that's, that's a take home point. We've got a lot of work to do in our region still to make this useful. Um, but the take home is that, or my take home for my lab is that we now have a relationship which we've, we've calibrated in a sense with Goliath Grouper. So we understand the acoustic response relative to the size of the animal. And we need to spend a lot more time trying to understand this for, for the diversity of organisms we have in the Gulf. And so we've attempted to work on this a bit within our lab. Um, you take a bunch of fish to the hospital and you say, hey, I want some scans. Uh, can we do that? And in many cases, they're, they're amiable as long as you do it at midnight. Um, and so one of the things that, that we really tr want to try to understand is what's the variation, the morphological variation of the species that we are most likely to encounter in reefs. And so here's a suite of, of, um, of examples that, that we've done in a paper that was just, uh, just accepted this week. Um, and so this comes from 149 CT scans that we did across the, the, the suite of species. And, um, and the intent of this, of course, is to understand, like I mentioned, the morphological variation in the fish. Because we know that the morphology of not only the, the fish, but importantly the swim bladder, its size, its shape, and its orientation, controls or directly related to the backscatter, the acoustic backscatter that you're going to get when you're out, sir, you're bobbing around, you know, pinging fish. The orientation and, and the morphology of this organism is going to be directly related to what you've just measured. And so you need to understand that. And, um, and so this, this is uh, just a PCA that demonstrates, just look broadly, you can see that all of these different species, they sort of occupy different places on this. And it's, it's a function of um, bladder size, which is on the x-axis, and, and bladder orientation on the y-axis. And so take home here is that if you look at this, um, you can find that, that some of the species that you're probably interested in with respect to management occupy different places on this. And so that suggests that there's some morphological variation and we would then expect acoustic variation to come from that. All right, and here's just a quick example of what that, that same uh, frequency space looks like. So this is across those sampling frequencies that I mentioned before, and this is target strength or the backscatter amplitude. And you can see that there's some, some differences that, are, that, that show up not only in these low frequencies where we don't tend to sample, but out here. These are the places where most of our fish finders exist. And so there is some differences, some important differences that we can begin to um, apply to discriminate these. And when we look at this across a, a statistical distribution, a probability distribution, we find that some of these guys, the ones that may, may be really important, like red snapper, um, triggerfish, vermilion snapper, they actually stand out apart from some of the others, uh, which is nice. So it offers some confidence um, as we move forward uh, to be able to potentially discriminate among these, uh, again, with a bit more uh, ground truthing information. But there is hope. So we have still got some work to do. Uh, we need to understand um, their internal or their, their in situ orientation. That is, so how is the fish oriented in the water column? We understand it's swim bladder orientation within the fish, but now how is the fish oriented in the water column? We need to derive distributions of those to understand how that will ultimately mediate the, um, uh, the backscatter that we receive. Um, need to spend a little, more, a little bit more work on understanding um, uh, some of the, the potential opportunities that come with machine learning and, and other advanced uh, analytical techniques, um, neural network classification and, and other clustering approaches where we can take this huge data set that we acquire and try to pick out um, patterns and pieces that will help improve our discrimination. Um, but the, the idea then is that once we do that, we have the potential to begin to separate or isolate some of these, these species and, and derive a, a more refined estimate of the, the community composition. Uh, oh, wrong way again. I'll get there. So when it works, when you have the information that describes these organisms, when you understand the acoustic properties, you can actually put it into practice. And so here's an example that's been around for a while. Uh, Rudy Closer and colleagues did this. Um, this is out um, between Tasmania and New Zealand. 
um, where their surveys are really focused on orange ruffy, this um, deep sea fish, and by taking the information they have, the in situ target strength data, but also the modeling information, um, they can begin to pick these pieces out. So they can take out orange ruffy from the rest of the, um, the, the dominant species that exist and begin to refine their estimates of the species. And we can do the same thing in the Gulf, but again, it's going to require a bit more effort and, and we, we really need to, uh, to take some time to do this. So I've mentioned that in most cases we're, we're sending, sending sound out at a particular frequency. So we call that narrow band. And, and some examples, 38 kilohertz, 70 kilohertz, 120 kilohertz. Those of you with recreational boats, you probably have one that operates at 50 and 200. All right, so those, um, those, those fancy fish finders that you have, you're like, ah, oh, there's a fish. So it's going to operate on one of those frequencies. And it's, generally, it's not going to uh, uh, expand across uh, continuous frequencies, recognizing that some of the newer systems are doing that. So if you have one of those, I apologize. Um, but some of the scientific devices now are allowing us to transmit across um, broad frequencies. We call this broadband. And so not only are we getting 38 kilohertz here, for example, but we're also getting 35 through 45, or 120 is now from 90 to 170. And so that offers many benefits. Important them, among them is the ability to refine our, our um, resolution. And so these are red snapper aggregations that we uh, collected uh, a couple months back. And I just want to point out to you that at 120 kilohertz, this is what red snapper look like. It's not really d too easy to see. But with the broadband approach, you can actually see if you squint really hard, you can see that these, these blobs have now turned into individuals. And so the individuals also have some information across that frequency space. Like I, I showed you that graph from Benoit, Bird, and Lawson. And this is what those look like, okay? And so from each of those individuals, we actually now get that fingerprint, if you will. So we have acoustic fingerprints, or we're, we're working to develop them, if you will, um, for these dominant species. And, and putting the, the camera systems that we had in the water at the same time, putting that data back into, um, into context with the acoustic data that we have, we can now begin to try to understand um, the relevance of those acoustic responses relative to their orientation, relative to their size, uh, and hopefully begin to develop our libraries to improve our abilities to use this in the Gulf. That's the, that's the goal. All right, so what are some of the other options that we have in, um, in, in the toolbox for improving our, our understanding of fish? Um, and I'll talk about two different multi-beam systems. So you just saw one that, that was really good at, at describing the bathymetry, right? And that came from the sail drone. Um, this is a similar type system, but instead of focusing on habitat, we're going to focus on the organisms in the water column. So we sort of, we oriented a little different. We use a different kind of, uh, or a different range of frequencies. And in this case, um, we were focusing on permit aggregations out on the Keys, and in particular wanted to see if we could quantify depredation, basically when a shark comes and eats an angled permit. And, and so that's what we've done here, and, and this is, it's, it's not a great view to see it, but just take my word for it. We've got, we've got these, these fish in green that are, that are coming through time, so A, B, C, and D. We've got this angled permit making its way to the boat, so students on the, on the boat, you know, pulling it in. And then in yellow shows up our, our fun friend, the shark. Comes in, interaction, actually captures and eats, eats our permit, and we end up with a permit head uh, instead of a permit body. Um, and so we're trying to explore ways to quanti quantify these, these in interactions um, between predators and prey, but use them in, in places where we're likely to, to have success, and the aggregations tend to, be, um, t tend to work well for that. Uh, another example is um, using, again, a multi-beam imaging sonar out of, again, a higher frequency. This is called an ARIS. And this is used for quantifying pelagic uh, interactions. You can use them in estuarine systems and, and all of that as well if you want to follow fish behavior, which I'm happy to talk to you about all of, all of that as well. But this is some recent work done in Mexico where um, we had one of these as a diver system and we're tracking the interactions between marlin and bait balls and ultimately trying to understand the, the feeding dynamics of, of marlin relative to the schooling dynamics of, of the bait balls or the sardines. And, and this is just to demonstrate, you know, if you have questions that are related to trying to quantify things at small scale. So the range of this is somewhere around 10 meters or so. So relatively small scale um, 
but needing the ability to quantify something that you, you won't really get from optics. Um, this may be a really good choice. And again, happy to, to talk about this later on if you're interested. Um, two, two new systems that are, that are coming available for, um, for use in fisheries work. Um, they weren't intended for this purpose. Uh, one is uh, called a FlexView from Kongsberg. It's, um, it is also a multi-beam, but a higher frequency multi-beam system. And I just point out that you can see this shoal wherever my pointer went. There we go. So really dense bait ball here. All of these little specks that you see moving around are, are other smaller fish, and there's a couple larger fish that you'll see swimming around. So a much, much broader field of view, but also high resolution. So you can track individuals and also look at, at interactions if that's of interest. Oh, I didn't do that. Um, <clears throat> and then the other one is this uh, the system from Coda Octopus. <sighs> what did I do? Uh, Coda Octopus. Let's see if I can do this again. There we go. Uh, and it's, it is also a multi-beam system, but it's a three-dimensional multi-beam. And so instead of everything being collapsed in two planes, in this case, you're actually getting three-dimensional information. So it's used, of course, for understanding structures and, and how, uh, how objects uh, look underwater and trying to characterize and quantify condition and change and all of that other stuff, mine detection and, and whatever. Um, but those that are fish nerds like me, we can use it to try to measure um, uh, information uh, related to some of the, the things that, that we may have, have an interest in, behavior and habitat association and all that. Uh, or you could imagine putting one of these on a platform and quantifying how large pelagic predators are occupying the space or uh, something like that. Anyway, again, happy to talk about this uh, offline if you like. All right, so <clears throat> take home messages. Um, we're doing okay. Uh, so this is, this is, offers, uh, this acoustic approach offers some opportunities for um, being a non-invasive approach for, for collecting data, but uh, it does require some additional input and some refinement on our part um, to be the useful long-term data set that, that we know it can be and is demonstrated to be in other areas. Um, it can, of course, be used to quantify these patterns uh, across broad or, or even really small scales, both temporally and spatially, and ask or allow us to answer questions related to behavior, habitat association, interactions, um, and, and probably other things that we haven't really thought much about yet. Um, but again, like I mentioned, uh, there's going to be some, some dedicated effort required to, to really make this um, operational at the survey level uh, and useful for, for our management approaches. All right, so I'll just wrap this up with um, uh, two slides that describe a workshop that we had last week. And so we spent uh, several days last week in St. Pete at USF where we had um, many folks from, from our um, NOAA fisheries management group um, but also some from Western Australia that came over to really talk about, well, how do we operationalize the use of acoustics for quantifying uh, a stock that is in decline, and how do we integrate acoustics with the optical systems that we have to, to attempt to do that. And so all the things that we've just laid out uh, are things that were discussed uh, at, at length during this, um, during this workshop, and the, the intent is to actually develop an approach. Uh, so. Um, think of it almost as a, as a recipe for how you would go about doing this um, uh, in, in a system that's not actually too different um, in terms of the, the organisms from the systems that we're dealing with here. And so this is over in Shark Bay in Western Australia, and they have this, uh, oops, I meant to, they have this, uh, this snapper that's not actually a snapper, um, and they, uh, they're really concerned about being able to quantify its response over time and, and it aggregates in particular areas uh, off, of, um, off of this island, which is now within a closed area, and they're trying to uh, quantify the, um, the, uh, the population, if you will, and doing it in, in, in a non-invasive manner where they don't actually have fishery-dependent data any longer. And so they're trying to develop fishery-independent methods uh, to efficiently survey these and ultimately um, end up with estimates of, of fish biomass for this particular species. And so hopefully we'll be able to, uh, to, to wrap up that design here for their operation in July. All right, and so with that, I will stop talking. Uh, happy to take any questions if you want, or um, happy to, to chat offline if, if that's useful. Thanks.
Thanks, Kevin. Uh, you guys any, any questions? I have a question. So, in the earlier part of your presentation, you, you noted the difference in um, biomass between artificial reefs and, and natural reefs. Of course, most of us here are familiar with artificial reefs. The actual design, layout, and plan of the reef is ultimately deterministic on its success and as a fish attractant. Do you have an explanation for why, why in, in every one of the cases that you list, listed on that uh, slide, the artificial reefs were more successful than the natural reefs? Um, I did not use the term successful. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, ultimately, this comes down to a sampling issue where, where we're sampling on artificial reefs. Everything's aggregated and accumulated in one spot. And so there's an elevation of, of biomass and, and fish density in that one area relative to the spread out area of the natural reefs where we say surveyed. So I think this is in large part a, a sampling issue and was one of the take home messages for why we need to rethink the way that we're laying out our surveys, which was the intent of that other slide to describe the, um, the way that we, we execute our acoustic surveys or the comparative surveys is really important and will have important implications for the mean estimates that we derive as well as the error that's associated with them. So again, I did not say that they were more successful. Uh, please don't misunderstand that. I just, it's an observation. There were more fish uh, associated with the artificial reefs than the natural reefs. I, I got one more question. Okay. Of course, I, 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 I'm still a little, you know, I think most people indicate biomass is a success. I mean, that, that's the ultimate intent of an artificial reef uh, comparisons. I do agree there are methodological reasons and in field observations that alter the way that presentation is given. But so I was very curious about your, you mentioned your acoustic uh, determinations for, for specific fish. Mm -hmm. um, is that in general down to like the family level or can you identify individual species by uh, that process? Well, that's, that's what we're, we're spending a great deal of time now trying to really develop and, and understand. Um, there's also a lot of error or variance associated with each of these measurements. And so our focus right now is actually trying to determine at what level will we be able to discriminate these, these species. And that's where all of this effort I've been mentioning comes in. We, we have opportunities to do this uh, as of now in certain areas and, or other systems where that effort's being put forth they're having success and they're, they're feeling quite confident in the abilities. We have a really complicated system with many, many species and many species in a relatively small area. So I'd say that it's still undetermined whether or not this is going to allow us to say, that's a red snapper, that's a vermilion snapper, that's a gray trigger fish. Um, indications from the modeling suggest that there's potential, but we just don't have the, the field effort yet to be able to put that into, into a, a, a better context. What do you think your next step is for trying to determine the unique signal for a red snapper? I mean, you're, how close are you? Well, so the, um, the, the effort that's required is, is going to, uh, it'll, it'll be laid in a couple different ways. So first you need to get red snapper. You need to insonify red snapper, an individual, and you need to replicate that many times to understand what's the variability in that signal. And it has to occur across a range of lengths that you're likely to see. Then you need to understand their orientation and the effects of that orientation and how similar that is to the models that we've developed. So the CT scan models that we have are of individuals and they are, you know, they are true fish and they provide, a, they provide an estimate of what we should expect. What we don't have is the next step, which is, well, now we need to put that into practice in the field and go and derive those measurements and then understand the level of variation that we have relative to what the models are suggesting. So a timeline? Well, um, how much money do you have? <laughs> um, th there are opportunities to do this, and you know, we're, we're doing it opportunistically at the moment, um, but dedicated effort should be placed. Um, you know, it's a suite of lab experiments and some, some field experiments that would really get us much further to that uh, place we want to be. 
So I have a, a, a follow-up question to that. On the slides where you were looking at the different band widths in, uh, for fish, uh, there was one, I think, in the 120 range, megahertz range, mm -hmm. where you can clearly uh, see a school of fish, and then it was refined in a, a range bandwidth where you indicated in your presentation that you could identify individual fish. Is that not the point where you can determine down to species level? Well, yeah, and that's precisely what we're trying to exploit. So that, that ability to resolve an individual and then understand the acoustic properties of that individual and link it back to what we understand to be representative of a particular species, right? And so if you have, let's go back to that. I think this is the one you're referring to? Is that right? So up here you can see individuals, right? And this is actually better a better description of that. So each of these is a fish, right? Each of those individuals is a fish. And these are the responses from some number of observations of that fish. And so the idea, the, the theory behind it suggests that, that there's gonna be a specific response, acoustic response across this frequency spectra. And, and that's what we're looking for. That's the fingerprint, if you will. Um, just like you would expect with um, a chemical signature and a, a GC, or a gas chromatograph. And so that's what we're aiming for. We're aiming for the, the patterns in the organism or the, the patterns in the response from that specific organism. And the question that we don't yet know the answer to is how similar are all of these other species that we observe with respect to that pattern? Does that pattern hold for a single species and have unique properties that distinguish it from something else? The models suggest yes, but the models are of the swim bladder. The models aren't of the fish as well. And that's one of the challenges that we've gotten through step one. There are probably another dozen steps left to really operationalize this in our region. And so it's a complicated physics problem, really, but it's also a sampling problem. And so, sure, if we have this data, and we have these individuals, and we have a camera sitting right next to it that's, that provides that data at the same time, and we're like, those are all red snapper. And so we then look at this response, and then we go and do it somewhere else at another place and say, those are all gray triggerfish. If those responses are unique, then we would feel much more confident saying, yeah, acoustically, we could identify them. Again, the model suggests that there's some potential, and the, the analyses that have been done to discriminate these suggest that there's a 90 or so percent chance of being correct. Um, but again, that's all based on the model. That's not based on, on reality, which is actually taking the time to go out in the field and, and evaluate this. Does that help? It does answer. So I'm just curious, Ed, have you done any interspecies uh, comparisons or trying to ferret out that information? For instance, mm -hmm. red snapper and lane snapper, at certain times of the year, they'll congregate together. Sure. Yeah, they certainly be on the same reef. Have y'all tried that or looked at that process? Um, well, we've looked at some of these. So funny thing, no one wants to pay for anything like this. They all just want it to happen. And so all of the work that I'm providing to you is largely been unfunded. It's just been opportunistic. Even the modeling is something that we did on the side of another project. Right? And so this, is, this requires, in, in other areas, there are dedicated efforts for this. Those that are serious about implementing these techniques for improving fisheries management have, have programs that are set up to do this. And so the intent of this talk is to show, here's some options, here are some opportunities that we can use. And so if we take some directed effort and try to do that, we may be successful. Will you determine a lane snapper from a red snapper? I don't know. Um, in fact, we actually don't, uh, we don't have enough data yet to, to suggest that we know what the differences are in lane snapper, even from the models. But I'm an optimist, so I think we're gonna get there. I noticed in your, in your survey design earlier, which would be your flower design, which is, is, is the standard way to sample something like this, but, mm -hmm. um, and it is very difficult to draw those straight lines, speaking for somebody that has a drive, <laughs> but uh, 
spatially and distance wise did you have some type of standard when you were doing that away from the reef or did you leave that to the captains or how, how did you come up with with your zone there that you were sampling around the reef so for those particular examples um, it was a it was a matter of time uh, really because we had we had so many days we had at sea we had so many sample stations that we had to accomplish uh, surveys at and so basically it was all right common denominator is you've got an hour to perform a survey what's the what's the most efficient way you can do this making sure that you the acoustics represent what we see with the rvs so the rvs are our, our ground truthing if you will and the rvs go down and they do these little sort of radial patterns and so the acoustic process was set up to do a similar thing to best replicate what the rov did um, in hindsight, I think we could have probably employed a different strategy, but that's, we didn't know that at the time. And, and I would, I mean, I, I applaud you for doing this, to look at that screen as much as you have to and, and the interpretation you have to make, but one of the questions that it would, would answer for us or for me would be the spatial distribution of these species away from the reef. Yep. I mean, how, how the, the, it becomes very important in the placement of the reefs um, in the future, and that's something that we're battling now when you're, in, when you're in a small zone, is how do you place these reefs and the spatial orientation of these reefs, and are they interacting with, with reefs in the same area? So you start set up some type of standard to where you're 100 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters. Uh, we've been sampling even 500 meters off the reef and, and still seeing some aggregates of, of these fish using that reef. So those are some of the questions that we're trying to answer, and this is, I mean, we. We don't, you know, do it to this fine of a scale, but we definitely do use uh, the acoustics to start tracking these fish, and then uh, do some the ROV stuff and some just some some uh, vertical line sampling just to see what's down there. So that's our ground truth. And but to set up some type of standard spatial standard, I think would be very beneficial in the future. For sure. Um, so uh, one of my students is actually focusing on that as part of her dissertation, and. Um, and so the transects that we, that we laid out in this example for our Florida work uh, were 500 meters on each, each side of the reef. And so we have the ability to look at that sort of background level, right? And, and indeed, you see, you see declines that, that happen within 50 meters or so of the reef. But occasionally, you do get the, the, the school or the, the pelagic um, group, if you will, cluster, shoal, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, you do get those at distance, but we don't tend to see any significant biomass that's detectable of demersal fish. Right? And so there's no indication of, of aggregations of, of reef fish in the places that we've looked. That's not to say that, that doesn't happen. Just in what we've looked at, it's always been a consistent decline within about 50 meters or so of, of these. And these are small scale. You know, some of them are, I guess. Some are, some are much larger. But, um, strike that comment. Um, generally, we have we have been able to observe that those declines happen yeah, 50 meters or so, and beyond. We we have the ability to, to ask those questions. Um, we haven't really spent a lot of time focusing on that aspect, but this would certainly allow you to to evaluate that. And actually, Ted Schweitzer has some interesting data, and in one of his some of the work they've done, where they've they've sort of done precisely that. And surveyed this expanse over over um, artificial reef, and had cameras deployed with baits, and you can actually watch the biomass move. All right, and that's that kind of gives you some context of what's the drawing range, if you will, of of these habitats. Um, albeit he added food, but uh, you know that it, it does have the capacity to help with that. I appreciate your 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 issues there. That's that's not easy. Everybody good? All right, thanks. All right, thanks, Kevin. Next, we have Dr. Sue Laura Barbieri. She'll be giving a talk on using marine animal tracking data to help inform management in the Gulf of Mexico. Morning, thanks for inviting me. I guess, I, was I the only one who thought there was a coffee break right now? <laughs> I had planned on that shot of caffeine, but okay, I'll try and be coherent anyway. Um, 
Uh, as you mentioned, I'm going to be talking about acoustic tracking and trying to put this in context. So um, I think everyone's aware that in fishery science, we're more and more focusing on spatial processes and how important they are to understanding productivity and vulnerability. They're not in the Beverton and Holt equations. And not that Beverton and Holt didn't think about them. I think Beverton and Holt seem to have thought about everything. Um, but they're not things that are plug and play necessarily, other than identifying the unit stock in stock assessments. But we're realizing that they're really important. So this is a figure from a collection of papers that I worked with colleagues from Europe that came out in ICES, looking at integrating spatial ecology into ecosystem-based management. Um, and we surveyed a number of people working in ecosystem-based management. Okay, yeah, I was taught how to do this. Yeah, okay, good. And, um, and we asked them what they thought were game changers. Um, and obviously, these are the types of things that we're talking about here, new data streams, um, and then some of the things that you can do once you get this new data, big data, artificial intelligence, modeling. Um, but I think we have to always remember, and I'm sure this group here is aware of this, that anything that you get done is a people thing. <laughs> You've got to get the people engaged to work with you. So you can have the best toys in the world, but you're playing in a sandbox with other people with toys, and if you can't get them to play well, you're not going to get the end result you want to move fishery science forward. So um, again, this is a paper that I really like um, I, for a couple of reasons. I just like the word future casting. Technology is moving so fast that if you're not future casting, you're probably being left behind. I think you'll hear that a lot from people. I also thought it was pretty interesting that this area right here, this sort of uh, 2000, 2015, is where I'd say we are in terms of applying um, this technology to fishery science. And I think it's interesting to note that just at the time that we're being able to apply some of these really awesome new technologies, of course, um, evolving technology is also allowing greater harvesting and economization of the ocean. So there are a lot more ocean, pre there are going to be a lot more anthropogenic stressors on the ocean. Um, and, and the question is, what, can we integrate this technology fast enough into our science to protect these ecosystems? I think Kevin's point in terms of we often want this data, um, but we often don't have the funding resources to implement new methods, new paradigms. We're running so hard, especially in the Gulf of so many species, just to get our stock assessments done. So I, I think that's a huge issue. Um, I, lucky for me to be talking about movement. Um, pretty much all animals are on the move with climate change. I think it was only five years ago I wasn't allowed to say climate change. But I, I think we're all pretty well aware now that it's happening. Um, it's happening with all sorts of animals. A couple of examples with fish. Um, in Portugal, recent examples, 20 new species. Northern Europe, sardines are replacing herring. Cod and haddock are moving north. They have to spawn in cold water for reproductive success. In the US, on the East Coast, black sea bass are slowly moving north. New York is actually suing the US Department of Commerce for a greater share of fluke. That was um, set up, the quotas were set up for its original center of abundance. That's changed. Um, and Pacific cod you know, is kind of the movement winner at this point huge change in distribution in a short period of time. So what's going to happen in the Gulf? Um, we don't know. You can only go so far north in the Gulf. Potentially fish will be going deeper. But until we have the information to actually be able to predict how fish are going to adapt to these climate changes, we're not going to be able to have effective management. And um, actually, this is just a quote down here from a couple of senators actually pointing out the importance of the changing climate and that we really need to get the data and the regulation in place to keep up with that, not to be fighting this um, trying to catch up game and dealing with lawsuits. So of course, with a changing climate, we also, um, it's uh, an emerging understanding. We're changing our understanding of some of the under, uh, assumptions that underlie stock assessments and traditional single species um, assessments, right? So a couple examples with cod. Um, we know that now just taking fishing mortality off, decreasing fishing mortality, does not ensure that your um, stock will recover. Lots of other things going on in terms of productivity there. Um, and that also productivity is often occurring at a much smaller spatial scale than our unit stock. So um, this is really the, um, I guess, outline the things I'm going to hit. So um, our assumptions are changing. 
But in terms of movement paths, these are some of the things that we can address that um, fit into traditional stock assessments. And then, of course, we have to go to that next level to understanding better, better understanding ecosystem processes. So um, there's a really amazing group of people working in the terrestrial realm. The Icarus project is actually um, led by Max Planck out of Germany. It's a German-Russia collaboration. They um, are putting a new, or have put, an antenna and computer system on the space station. They're completely revolutionizing our capacity to do satellite tracking. Um, I had the great opportunity to work with Martin Kelsky, who's the leader of that, um, on a paper about movescapes in the ocean and Roland Keyes, who's the leader of MoveBank. And if you want to see how, you know, sort of the vision of where we would love to get with fisheries, go look at MoveBank. Um, so these are mainly terrestrial animals, but you can see their patterns over space and time. And this <coughs> emerging idea of the macroscope, right? So with remote sensing and satellites, we can now begin to understand ecological processes at a different scale than you can with human observation, much like the microscope. It's going to totally change our understanding of um, processes and what we need to protect on Earth. But like Kevin mentioned, and I really enjoyed that, any of these new um, technologies also have challenges. We, when we write our papers, we use the best possible data to um, answer a question, right? And we often don't write the papers talking about the underlying problems but they exist and we have to figure them out if we want to actually apply these technologies effectively. So um, big challenges, ocean is really big, um, fish are underwater, <laughs> don't I sound like I have a PhD? Um, fish are underwater, we don't have any marine GPS, um, there's very few borders or boundaries to movement, apex predators typically have much larger home ranges than what we see in terrestrial systems. So what are some of the solutions, things that we're working on? Um, one of them, and again, this is probably why I focus on it, it, the people part is as important as the new tech, um, is these networks where people are exchanging data or consolidating tracking data, whether it's PSATs, um, and here's yellowfin tuna, all the PSAT tracks in the Gulf, or whether it's acoustic tracking, um, and I'll explain a little bit what that is, but the idea being that you have arrays um, and these receivers in these arrays detect tagged fish moving by, but they're traditionally just the space that one PI or one lab can cover. Um, but if we can actually get people to exchange data across all those arrays, we then have comp revolutionized what we can do. Of course, there's a lot of new tech in this field as well. Um, you know, mobile platforms, the sail drones, um, I like Darren's question about how they compare to wave gliders. Wave gliders have been used a lot more to date anyway with acoustic tracking than the sail drones. So I'll be interested in hearing the answer to that. Um, and we've done some work again with gliders um, and putting different acoustic sensors on there. Part of that was collaborating with Steve and his group at USF. Um, the Icarus project, which I mentioned, which is here, and I always use as a cautionary tale. Um, Martin's one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He started this, they thought it was all good to go about a year ago. Huge um, output, all these articles, uh, like a, I don't know, five page article on him in Nature. And then they couldn't get the Russians to turn the antenna on. So um, again, it comes down to people. Best tech in the world, it's gonna come down to people. Now, they did just yesterday. It's all up and running and they just started the program. And they're building new tags as well. They're building marine tags, they're about a year out. Um, and I'm working with them as a consultant on that. Not a paid consultant, I should say, just sharing some brain power. Um, I think one of the biggest things, I think Kevin put, touched on this, and we all should be thinking about it, is that any of these processes, we're really talking about fish behavior. That's really hard to get at. It's gonna take multiple techniques, it's not just one. So what I, as a researcher, care about is understanding fish movement and how that impacts productivity and vulnerability. I don't care which technique I use. Right now, acoustic telemetry is one of the best ones I can use, and I've invested a lot of time and energy in that, but my lab also does dart tagging. We're um, working on um, biogeochemical tracers, collaborating with people, genetics. So uh, it's really gonna take getting these techniques applied um, in a unified way to get the answers I think we wanna get. In terms of um, tracking, there are, again, um, a number of new techniques coming online. 
Uh, Vemco, which is now Anovasi, is the biggest provider of acoustic tracking um, equipment. Uh, I work really closely with them um, through ITAG um, and talking about some of the things that scientists would like to see them develop. They have a number of things coming online. They're actually investing 20 million in the next 10 years um, in new tracking tech. There's also ROMES, which is out of MIT and HUI. It's kind of the opposite of acoustic tracking, so you put out sound sources. It only takes four in the Gulf, very low sound sources. And then your tag is actually like a receiver. It only works with deep water pelagics. Again, we're about a year out, but we're hoping to do a pilot study with that uh, next year. Okay, so actually I probably should have explained what acoustic tracking was before that slide. But <laughs> does anyone not know how acoustic tracking works, or does everybody feel comfortable with that? Okay, that didn't answer my question, but I'm going to um, just really quickly show the way it works. You have um, a tag attached to your fish. It can be external or internal. We often do internal implantation. Um, it has to swim within range of your um, receiver. And your range is going to depend on where your receivers are at. So like in a pass, high current, high noise environment, about 80 meters um, for consistent 50% detection. Offshore, 500, 600 meters. Um, it can be impacted by weather. These are the types of things that we often don't look under the hood. Um, but if you put out, and we do this all the time, and now they're embedded in the receivers, if you put out tags to track how your range changes over time, long term at your study site, you'll see temporally it changes. Um, and so you have to think about what's the minimum range you can use to make your inferences. And then, okay, so what, are tracking net what do tracking networks do? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about iTag. So um, at the most general scale, what they do is they're bringing together tracking data from either past studies or ongoing studies, and then leveraging it to improve what we can understand. Um, Barbara Block probably was her paper on this, where she pulled together all the SAT uh, tracks was one of, a big, big changer in this space. Um, and that's, that's using something like this over here. And then acoustic tracking, um, again, is exchanging across arrays. I don't think it's surprising with changing climate, change, changing movement patterns, and, and this really quite accessible technology now, that there's huge investment globally in tracking um, animals in general, fish specifically, marine fish specifically. This is just a, um, this is on our website if you want to get any more detail, but basically what we're seeing here is all these different regional networks. This is the group I worked with, Roland, the terrestrial, that I suggest you check out if you want to see where we'd like to get to. Um, and they also have Animove, which is a series of trainings. And then the rest of these are all acoustic um, marine. Um, IMOS is one of the uh, longest running in Australia. Michelle Heppel is leading that now. They're doing some really cool work. Um, OTN has huge funding out of Canada um, to increase, um, try and set up a global network and increase infrastructure. They loan receivers. Um, and then you have marine megafauna, so this is mainly PSATs. Myco out of Duke, this is a big one. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Max Planck, the animal behavior, and Icarus, they have the coolest stuff. I like learning from people that are ahead of me, so I often go and check out what they're doing. And just as, a, as an aside, again, Kevin brought this up, but what I see people investing in, in terms of the tracking and tracking networks outside the US, is a lot more than what we're doing here. So I gave a keynote at the European Tracking Network, and what, they ha what they're doing, the amount of receivers they have, and the research they're doing with tracking fish, blows out of the water what we're doing here in the US, which, which blew me out of the water because I actually thought we were a little further along. So um, interesting times. So ITAG, so the Integrated Tracking of Aquatic Animals in the Gulf of Mexico. Yes, cute acronyms do matter. Um, and what, what we are, what have we done so far? So we um, had a first meeting in 2014, um, brought together a group of people, some great scientists, Jay Rooker, Will Patterson, um, myself, I'm not sure I was a great scientist at that point, but I'm still striving on that. Um, stock assessment scientists, so Clay Porch, Bazad Mahmoudi, um, and Ocean Tracking Network, and thought about, you know, movement is so important to management. How, what can we do to begin getting the data we need? Um, and what we focused on was building tracking capacity, which is building this network as a first step. We had a meeting, and that picture is from it. We, um, we weren't very high tech at that time, actually, so we quickly ran and made little um, pieces of paper with the letters on them. I, I later was sorry that I held up I. <laughs> that probably sent the wrong message, but that stands for integrated. Um, 
So what have we done since? So we've had five years of, of this, and we did ask at this meeting, one of the coolest moments was actually we went around the whole room, we had about this many people, and asked people what would they like a network to provide? What would they like to see it do? And then we built our business model around that. Um, not easy. I've read a lot of books in terms of how to get people to cooperate since then. Not sure I've gotten better, but I'm certainly more aware of some of the pitfalls. Um, and then since then, we're now just at the stage that it's really getting too big for my lab to um, keep being the ones that are doing this in a volunteer fashion. But we did want to have a workshop and shift towards the science. Um, and that was this workshop in 2019. You see we have a better sign. Look at that bridging the gulf. Um, and what we did there was really cool, actually. We had a number of um, st statisticians come, a number of groups of people. We had identified ahead of time papers that we were going to work on that drew on the ITAG database. Um, and then we had a couple of classes in network analysis, some key um, ways that people might want to address this. This was um, mainly targeted towards early career scientists and students. Um, and then we had the statisticians on call group, breakout groups to start those projects, those papers, and bring in the statisticians to ask about any help they needed. Um, and those papers are underway. Ooh, okay. So, so what have we done? We have a shiny website. It was very painful to make, so please feel free to go check it out and enjoy it. Um, by the numbers, so uh, this is something that anybody who's tracking in the Gulf, if you sign our membership agreement, you can become a member. Um, we have way more than 1,600 tags out there. I need to update this slide. But we've um, exchanged 11 million plus detections throughout the Gulf. Um, and we are always trying to be aware of new tech, test new tech, let people know about it. We have this interactive map which shows where all the different arrays are. Here you can see it bigger. And if you go and click on one of those fish, it'll pop up, it'll tell you who's the PI of that array, how many receivers they have, what species they're targeting their study on, and potentially link to a website if they have it. Um, and then we, so we have the integrative map, we have the data exchange, we have semi-annual, um, what that actually means is about every year and a half meetings, um, the website, and the key point is getting too big to run out of my lab. That's what we've been doing so far. So here's our current steering committee. Great group of people, um, both scientists, stock assessment scientists, industry, Ruth from Shell, Jason from the fishing industry, um, Mike Dance, who just recently joined us. He's in Louisiana. So we have um, people on the steering committee from throughout the Gulf. It's really important. And then this is my lab, who um, just love the fact that I usually ask them to do most of the work. But what have we actually figured out? Okay, so the data exchange shares data across arrays, um, and what happens is you upload your tags online, and then you upload any tags that were detected in your array that aren't your fish. Um, and an automatic email is generated to connect the tag owner and the array owner, and then they share data. Um, and the scientific results that have come out of that to date um, include um, learning that nurse sharks actually make uh, long migrations, long annual migrations. You would not uh, expect that. They look like couch potatoes. Um, tarpon, connectivity between the Atlantic and the Gulf. Um, this nice paper out of Will's lab um, using movement signatures to tell when your tagged red snapper has just been eaten by a shark, a bull shark. Um, and then this paper uh, out of Steve Zettelmeyer's group looking at a series of sharks and finding that you can tag them in Alabama, but they're moving as far as the Keys and sometimes up around the East Coast. So it is changing our understanding of the distribution and movements of a range of species. But if you look at this map, you'll see there's not a lot of coverage over here. And you'd want to have a line right here to look at movement between Mexico and the US, and a line off of here to better understand um, East-West. And we had lines down here in the Keys that my lab oversaw for five years, and then we ran out of funding, so we just pulled those. OK, so next steps. Um, like I mentioned, we're, I, I, this was all really a volunteer effort. I, I think we, and it was, for me, it was worth it. I wanted to have this proof of concept so we could then grow this and get to the next level. Um, and I've learned a ton. I think everybody's gotten something out of it. Um, but it's, it's gotten too big for just my lab to do that and for us to do the research we do as well. Um, in terms of networks in general, they, the biggest benefit goes to people who are tagging highly migratory species. Ironically, I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I seem to have picked the species that don't move a whole lot or move somewhere where nobody has receivers. Um, and it's really important that we begin to change that, you know, cost benefit. It should be 
the data should be important for space-based management and understanding who's in your array and these interactions, like what Will and Aaron did, as well as just increase, connecting the dots to increase the space over which you can track a fish. Um, what this shows, this is all the arrays off of Florida. Um, this is one of those papers we're working on from that workshop. And what you can see is that the, if they're green, all green, they're mainly detecting their target species. But if they're primarily red, they're detecting more um, other species than their target species. Um, this red drum one happens to be one of ours. So there are some things that we can do to improve that, I think, down the road. We need to invest in arrays that are going to be long-term monitoring sites. So right now, this is all volunteer. It's wherever um, a lab puts out an array, and that where that array goes changes with each study and each funding cycle. To really understand what's going on, we're going to have to invest in long-term arrays. Um, and then we need to, so the data exchange has been great, and I think we want to keep some component of that because it really um, helps foster collaborative interactions and some creative ideas about how to use the data. But we also need a database. So right now the data is not being archived. Again, if you look at MoveBank, they have the state of the art. I hope we can get to there someday. Um, what they have is they have, you put in your geo-referenced geo um, tracking data. Although, let me back up. So they're long-term funded through Max Planck for 20 years. So that's why they can do this. <laughs> but they have, um, you put in your tracking data, you get to choose how much you share or don't share with other people on, that are part of it. And then there are different layers, environmental layers that you can get. So you can link up your geo-referenced track with the environment or habitat. And that's where I would love to see us go in the Gulf. OK, so um, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time. So I'm going to whiz through this part um, fairly quickly. But because um, I work in the space that is between um, research for research sakes and how, and how it can be applied to fisheries management, I'm always thinking about um, research that can help inform um, stock assessments. So these are the typical stock assessment uh, parameters, right? Um, in blue, these are things that um, tracking can help inform. And then this is uh, some of the things that, you know, I think we're beginning to think about. You know, the biomass question came up. Well, it's not just biomass, it's biomass distribution over space. So just taking the biomass that used to be spread out over a lot of natural reefs and aggregating it to a much smaller, denser space with an artificial reef. I'm not saying if that's happening, that's something we need to figure out. Um, but that's not changing biomass, that's changing spatial distribution. So in terms of addressing mortality, I think this is probably one of the um, key areas that telemetry is being used and can be used. And actually Darren's paper from the 2013 is one of the seminal papers in terms of beginning that process. Um, some more recent papers, a lot on um, discard mortality. Again, just using uh, Will's, he's a close collaborator, so it's easiest to, to pick this. But um, they had uh, two different arrays, VPS, so that's a virtual position, high resolution tracking. And then they looked at the movement signatures of both their um, red snapper, their target study, that they had tagged, and gray triggerfish, and then um, tagged sharks that came into their system, bull sharks. They collaborated with the people that were the bull shark trackers, and they were able to actually use those movement signatures to see when their red snapper stops moving like a red snapper and starts moving like a bull shark. Very cool. And the way that works, right, so each species has its own movement signature. Here's a couple from work we've been doing in Madison Swanson. Um, so this is amberjack. So you can see over here is detections over time. They show up in Madison Swanson mainly with the spawning season. And this is along our array, which just follows the reef structure here. You can see they have a pretty good horizontal distribution. Red snapper, in contrast, have a much smaller home range. They tend to stay in one place. And in fact, if you don't have tags on them um, that show where they are in the water column, so you can get pressure sensors now so you can get 3D movement, you often think your fish is dead. Or at least I did. I was coming from fish that moved a lot more than red snapper when I did my first red snapper study. But I think the really exciting area, and this is something that ITAG is facilita facilitating, um, is then the next step is, okay, so now you have these multiple studies on red snapper and discard mortality. Can we bring these studies together and look at what factors are actually driving our ability to determine discard mortality? Look under the hood. So um, attachment method is a biggie. A lot of those external tags fall off. You can't tell if you have a dead fish or if you just lost your tag. It's the same movement signature. That's huge. <laughs> um, 
another issue is your array design. So to assign fate, you have to be able to have a fairly decent sized array to know whether that fish is still happily moving around or whether it just left your detection zone and you have no idea if it's dead or alive. Um, spawning habitat and use, that's um, something that my um, lab has focused a lot on, but because I'm running a little late, I'm going to zip through these. This is published. You can ask me about it later or find the papers if you'd like. Um, we use soundscapes to figure out spawning distribution of sea trout. Oh, and that's what they sound like. I forgot that was in there. Um, and then we found this high density spawning site, spawning aggregation site. Um, it's at this pass here, most consistently used. Um, every single day of the spawning season. And we had some capture-based sampling which showed that fish moved to the site only to spawn. Uh, green colors is showing that you're spawning, actively spawning. Not very far to the east, um, totally different signature in terms of the percent spawning. And what, this, what we've then done, we had uh, this array. So each red dot is a receiver and then the red square is our um, passive acoustics. So we have passive, passive acoustics, that's the aggregation sound, to track population level sound. So we can say, in fact, every single day of the spawning season there was an aggregation there. Um, but by tracking fish, and that's one of the um, movement paths of a female, you can actually see how far away are they being drawn from. And if they were in this spawning site, they were spawning because they only moved there to spawn. So you could use that to estimate your spawning frequency. A lot of our traditional methods are based on the assumption of no immigration or emigration, but we have the ability now to test those assumptions. And in fact, for spawning frequency, they typically do not hold. So we found that female spotted sea trout spawn um, about half as much as you'd think they would under most traditional sampling. And with traditional sampling at this site, they would have been spawning every day. So we found them spawning about every nine days. And we were able to get male um, spawning frequencies, which we have no histological method to do that. So what that means is then you can look at female versus male spawning frequencies, and then look at how they change with size. So it's changing what we can do um, if we can integrate some of these different methods. And a, a real huge take home method, me message, was that although we have an aggregation there every single day, it's different individuals. It's not the same individuals that are there. So that's huge, whether you're trying to do the great red snapper count, um, not that red snapper aggregate spawn, they don't. Whether you're trying to estimate abundance, you have to understand the movement to and from these sites. Um, and that's the next thing, space use, recruitment, and abundance. So Jay Rooker has done some really nice work. These are a couple of very elegant papers. Um, this one using acoustic tracking to look at space use of um, predators, great um, barracuda, and then some potential prey, and seeing that there's space use overlap really happens at dusk and nighttime, which makes sense to decrease um, your predation risk. Um, I think that's pretty cutting edge. I think that's one of the first papers that's really looked at that. And then this nice paper also that Jay led um, using passive acoustics and, and pulling together all those tracks to look at fish crossing national boundaries. You know, fish are not following, there's no walls there. <laughs> Nobody built the wall for fish. They're crossing international borders. And that's important as we think about our governance. Um, Red Drum, again, most of this is published, so you can go and look for it if you'd like or ask me about it, but we've done a lot in terms of integrating a number of different techniques. So we have genetic tag recapture with a purse seine. So all these fish are non-lethally non sampled. We've sampled about 9,000. We also get um, reproduction size from those fish, and then we tag um, fish at part of that community. So we had about 100 adults tagged and 40 sub-adults tagged. Um, and so what you can see is Red Drum, these are our arrays in white, and these red ones are um, arrays that weren't part of our study, but through ITAG we were able to get the data from them. So what you see is this really high density of red drum, not surprising, during the spawning season as they aggregate to spawn. And then outside of the spawning season, they're very widely distributed and mainly not anywhere where our arrays are. We still don't know what the annual migratory space use is there. Anyway, we're doing um, some really cool modeling to look at temporary movement to and from the spawning aggregation to um, improve our estimates of abundance with the Jolly Seaver model. And it turns out you get about 16% less abundance um, when you incorporate that. Another study that just came out, um, we tagged sub-adults from two different estuaries and found different recruitment times, different movement ecology being impacted by natal um, estuary and spawning site. Kind of mind-boggling, actually. 
a couple more of those papers that we're working on. These are really, really painful papers. Now that I'm working on all of them, I realize why they haven't been done before. Um, but the keys um, is one of the papers we're doing here. This is the range of tagging sites of fish that were detected in the keys section here. If you look at habitat, um, obviously different species are using different habitat proportionally. Of course, my species was the amberjack, which got detected on nobody else's receivers, but that's another story. So, um, but what it can help us begin to understand is, the, again, the space overuse, um, shark hotspots, potential bycatch, so predicting where high bycatch situations would be. We have a lot of sawfish that we detect. Um, so, so some really interesting um, applications. Um, and the same thing, we have a paper pulling together the ecoregion off of West Florida shelf and looking at um, the movement ecology and, and what it means for fisheries management. So I hope I've made the case that moofscapes are species specific and that they matter to both traditional um, stock assessments and ecosystem-based management. And the real thing that we want to get to is this. I think we're all aware that ecosystems, marine ecosystems, trying to understand their resilience is really complex. Um, this is a great paper that came out recently and is talking about the complexity of natural ecosystems and that the temporal scale of benefit versus risk is out of whack. So you can push for high productivity short term and global markets do that but you're eroding resilience that you probably have no idea what you've eroded until you have some sort of collapse down the road and that's very hard to change that. Migratory species seem to be especially susceptible. So my, my end thing, movement's complicated. We really wanna to bring together as many different techniques as possible, invest in what it takes to really use this new tech in a meaningful way. I think we have an opportunity to do that in the Gulf um, and uh, I, I hope that we will potentially set this up as a case study that can can lead fishery science uh, for the nation, maybe the world. Thanks so much. Thanks, Sue. I'm sorry to give you your coffee break. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a, probably a few questions. I, um, I was just so excited to see your talk, and I was let down. Um, but now it's good to see what's changed in the last 10 years since I've stopped tracking. And it's, it's very promising. There's a lot of things we can finding out now that we never knew it was possible. I mean, I, I didn't have VPS when I was doing it, so you know, I thought manual tracking was character building. So yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. good to see that things have changed and not stressing out the grad students anymore. Oh, we're still stressing out the grad students, just, <laughs> just in new different ways. ways. <laughs> different ways. Is there any questions? I have, so I have a couple questions. I, I noticed on the slide that you had for the Icarus project that there were certainly two major pathways that were indicated, one through Central Europe that went all the way down to the, uh, the Rift Valley, and then one through China that went through the Yellow River Valley and then uh, Northwest Passage. I'm assuming that's an avian pathway between those two because they went over large bodies of water like the Mediterranean Sea. Yep. And then I guess the question I have is, is the Icarus Project tracking other than the obvious? Are there any large mammal movements? Uh, I thought of that when you look at the Rift Valley because we know there are large yep. migratory patterns with the larger mammals in Africa and in China. Yeah, great question. So there are, um, I'm part of the Gordon Research Council meetings. I don't know if people have heard of those on movement ecology. And that brings everybody who's studying movement ecology regardless of species there. Um, and a lot of those tracks they showed there in the Rift Valley are in fact um, mammals. So elephants, zebras, but they pronounce it zebras. It took me a little while to figure that out. And um, what other, there's some really cool work that they're doing on um, some of the big cats as well. Lots of tracking going on in that area. And um, really interesting, again, to look at what they are learning in their terrestrial species. So, so like for the zebras, um, they are highly migratory unless you provide water for them. So if you provide unnatural ponds for them to get their water, they will not make their long migratory treks. And in fact, they did that. Um, I'm going to blank on the country where that was. But it did impact the long-term health of that species. And, and I think about that all the time when I think about artificial reefs versus natural reefs. Um, I do a lot of work on natural reefs, a lot of work on reproductive success. You know, fish are pelagic spawners, so where and when they spawn impacts where their young end up and whether they have reproductive success. So I think that's really important to draw on some of the things they're doing cutting edge in the terrestrial realm and apply them to what we're doing in the marine. Thank you. I, I, in your opening comments, you mentioned the impacts that 
global warming or climate change is having on particular species. And you indicated a, a couple of marine species that are now migrating or patterning further northward. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think the long-term prognosis or diagnosis for estuarine-dependent species like spotted sea trout that you mentioned towards the end of your presentation that are more estuarine-dependent and don't reflect those uh, uh, longitudinal migratory patterns? Right. Again, a great question. So. Um, since they spend their whole life cycle in the estuary, it's really going to depend on which estuary they happen to be born in, right? So you potentially will have some southern estuaries that can no longer support those species. Um, I, we're not at that point yet. I, I'm not aware of that being an issue yet. I do know snook are moving north, so we're seeing snook in areas we never did before. They're much more tropical species. Um, I, I think that that's something that as we begin to tease out, um, and I'm working with Kenny Rose on some of this actually, understanding drivers of movement. And not, it's not just the thermal preference, but whether you have thermal preferences at different stages of the life stage that are gonna really drive um, how far you move, where you need to move to, and how impacted you are by climate change, if you're a fish. Uh, I'm glad to hear that, because one of the things the TCC has considered and charged some of our subcommittees with is looking at or trying to find a pattern across the Gulf. One, a couple of species that we're looking at is spotted sea trout, where we clearly know the populations uh, are, are in decline. What we don't know, uh, and it would include uh, shellfish uh, also, but what we don't know is, is this fishing pressure or is there some sort of environmental change that's affecting that patterning? And I think that's one of the things that really speaks to the new tech, right? So new tech is emerging for us to understand fisheries behavior. But you need to link that with the traditional methods of, of monitoring fish, right? And I, I'm lucky to work at FWRI. I work a lot with Ted. Um, I'm able to pull in directed studies as well as the amazing data sources that he brings together or our fisheries dependent people. Um, Bev's group brings together. We just finished something on GAG. So I, I think that's really where we need to go is this investing in new tech, but realizing that you need to um, integrate that with the traditional data if you're gonna try and get the answer you need to get. It, it's very, they're very complex systems and each species reacts differently. I guess my final question. <laughs> well, so. I'm separating everybody between the coffee break. Uh, <laughs> so I'm interested in the acoustic arrays that you set up. You know, obviously there are pros and cons for, for different types of taggings that occur, certainly acoustic arrays. It only tells you the point at which it, the fish is near the array. You know, the, the, the set of the array, the pattern of the array has potential Im impacts on what you're seeing. It, it also doesn't have a clear indicator of what happens once it gets out the array zone. So are y'all considering other things, like I know other states are considering or have implemented a satellite tracking program, of course it has its pros and cons too but sort of to verify the acoustical array, the, the sensitivity of the array. Right, so the state of the art right now is to have the best of the both worlds, you double tag. We have a pilot study just starting this fall with yellowfin tuna that will be both acoustically tagging and PSAT tagging and putting receivers on oil rigs so that we can get that large track, but usually has very low resolution. It doesn't have high enough resolution to know if that fish is actually near an oil rig. Um, and then you can also have the acoustic tracking to get that high resolution. Right now, that's, that's the best that we have, um, is to put those two together. But for large pelagic species like yellowfin tuna, I think roams is gonna be a game changer. Um, and I'm working with Simon Throw and Hui. Um, we just had a Go Moses symposium and, and he came, we talked about all these things. So we're gonna try and set up some pilot studies with that um, because that will give you both a large track and high resolution. Yeah, I noticed that on your slide you had indicated, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little familiar with the acoustical array that, that, that are near shore or inshore, but you indicated on the slide that showed the Gulf-wide distribution of those that it might be effective to have some of those off the continental shelf. And I was just wondering how that worked and, and how those are deployed. Would, you know, in a, an area like a, a deep trench area like the DeSoto Canyon, how would they deploy? be deployed and, and what would you think would be some of the results from that? Well, I do think we, we have a real need to better monitor deeper water. So um, Vemco, I guess five years ago, I guess actually came with, up with acoustic release receivers. You used to have to buy V4s and I think they cost about $4,000 a pop. 
I really wanted a lot of those. I could never get the budget to get those. Um, when they came up with the acoustic release, that was excellent. And that's what we use in Madison Swans in about 70 meters. Um, and any of our you know, reef fish habitat that we're monitoring, we're one of the few people that actually have receivers out in deeper water, though. For good reason. Um, you, it's a lot more work. <laughs> there's, there's a lot, the, the, hard, the easy part is actually um, buying the receivers. And then the fun part is tagging the fish. The hard part is, is actually maintaining those receiver arrays year after year after year. Um, and I, I think that's something we really need to think about. In terms of really deep water, um, you'd have to still use a V4. The, um, the typical Vemca receiver goes to 500 meters. Um, VMTs go deeper than that. So there's, um, some really cool, there's a cool restore project on marine mammals, and they're putting out deep water monitoring sites. And they said, if I can get 20 VMTs to them, they'll put them on those sites. Um, and that they will work with fairly deep water and begin to give us an idea of what's going on. But again, that has to be something that comes from a funding process or group that is not, um, that I don't need to get paper out of it in a year. Nobody's going to get paper out of that in a year. So that has to be something that we're thinking at this larger scale. This is moving fishery science forward. Um, and we know we need to take these baby steps, but it's not going to be an immediate success metric for anyone. Um, it's do we invest in the future, I think. I just touched my face. Sorry, I'm not supposed to do that either. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. Let's go ahead and take a break. Um, 15 minutes. All right, thanks. Okay, next on the agenda, we're going to continue with the talks. And we have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Scott Denton. She's going to talk to us about artificial intelligence and machine learning innovation in fisheries and protected species monitoring in the Gulf of Mexico. Oh. Uh, you got to press your button. Thank you. Um, this morning I'd like to talk to you about uh, something that's relatively new to me. Um, I am the administrator for the Galveston uh, Reef Fish and Shrimp Observer Programs. And this is a new uh, concept and innovation that's come about that we're hopeful to use uh, in those fisheries and others. Artificial intelligence is basically using computer systems to perform tasks that no normally require human intelligence. And we see this every day. Um, Siri, our phone, uh, Tesla, cars drive themselves, Netflix learns what movie to like, um, Nest, this is a uh, thermostat uh, in your home, I'd never heard of it but it learns the patterns of, of the temperature you like, uh, drones, and Facebook as well. Machine learning is an application of AI that provides systems the ability to automatically learn and improve from experience, so repetition, without being explicitly programmed. There is a, a increasing need for industry and marine researchers to build partnerships to op um, optimize this learning capacity. And it has a huge amount of, of uh, applications. The projects I'm going to talk to you today are um, based on previous developments made by primarily the Alaskan Fishery Science Center and the Southeast Fishery Science Center Galveston. Okay, also contained in the machine learning concept is um, a new open source video image anal analysis for marine environments. It's called Viami. It's a uh, Viami toolbox and a tool used to use Wally and ML for, for automated object detection, tracking, and classification of marine species. And what Miami was uh, originally applied to was underwater fishery surveys, where they have just huge, uh, huge amounts of data coming in. Uh, Miami's computer vision, library, and ML algorithms are streamlined for processing 
still photos and that huge amount of video, uh, acoustics, what have you, uh, coming in. And it's resulted up to a 75% cost savings for some of these surveys. The, the major concepts involved um, in this machine learning um, process involve images and video. So you're basically feeding the algorithm all these videos. And what it is, it's the, the images and video combined with annotation and analytical tools like Viami is one example. And annotation simply means you have a photograph of a red snapper, for example. You put the metadata in, so when the computer sees it, red snapper, it's, it knows what to refer to. This is a red snapper. It's just um, telling the algorithm what that fish is. And then uh, derived data and the data output. And the, the whole concept uh, is shown below. It's a so it's deep learning, uh, convolution neural network. It's got a lot of really intricate uh, aspects to it. Again, Viami was created for NOAA um, through partnership with uh, Kiteware Software Developer and its partners. <clears throat> it's open source uh, system for video imagery. And I, I tried to, well, I did Google it. And it shows, uh, this is the side below is, is uh, where you can see uh, actual the process. However, there was no, at least I tried for computers, I couldn't get any audio to it. <clears throat> this is a uh, basic concept. You take video, repeated uh, video, still shots, what have you, of every angle of, this is a hell of it for this example, every angle of that fish. Um, again, this all goes into you annotation, feeds into the software, and it, it does, um, the more photos you feed it, the better the algorithm improves in learning. In the Gulf of Mexico um, shrimp fishery, um, we, again, we have um, outstanding observers out there collecting data um, for bycatch purposes, primarily, um, but then from the get-go, actually, we recorded protected species. This is an example of a small to sawfish, and again, as you all are well aware, the, the Gulf of Mexico shrimp fishery is one of the most economically valuable and important fisheries. Uh, the observer programs collect bycatch that are critical to the Gulf. Council and NIMS performing um, stock assessments, including undersized target and protected species. We did, the last several years, have done uh, electronic monitoring um, on long flying boats as well as on contract shrimp boats. Um, and we found that it performed well and, and documenting um, large by catch. The EM reviewers uh, documented the catch of a loggerhead sea turtle that was in the tri net, uh, tarfish, angel shark, black tip shark, red snapper, mutton snapper, rock shrimp, toadfish, fellfish, and so on. And that reviewer is doing the same thing that the um, ML, uh, Miami uh, system is doing. So the time saved is, is totally incredible. <clears throat> the, our current observer coverage in the Gulf is uh, low. It's 2% of the annual commercial effort. And by catch of rare events, uh, are, uh, require large sample sizes. Um, we looked at uh, sample size estimates required uh, for an observed sawfish with a CV of 0.3, and it resulted in over 11,000 tow hours per year. And applying this with with the cost of observer day uh, resulted in a 
extremely prohibitive, prohibitive costs. Um, use of email um, in conjunction with the EM or electronic monitoring provides a valid alternative if the goal is to uh, strictly monitor interactions with large bycatch or rear events without pushing up the cost of, of ZERG coverage. Again, uh, talking about the application would be good in both the shrimp fishery and the mid-hanging fishery. And basically the goal is to collaborate, uh, numerous collaborators, to research, deploy, and evolve innovative AL, ML, EM electronic, electronic monitoring systems for the shrimp and menhaden fisheries. Again, we're documenting uh, rare species or species of interest. It will learn whatever fish you want to find out about being caught. Uh, we, in May 2011, uh, at the request of the regional office, Southeast Regional Office, we implemented a federal observer program for the Gulf of Mexico Menhaden fishery for one season. Uh, the pilot study completed 54 sea days and uh, documenting rare events, at, which were three marine mammals and two sea turtles. Um, the the uh, phases, we'll see phase one, and that's uh, develop and deploy camera and housing systems. And phase two is to annotate that imagery. That's basically all those thousands and thousands of, of still photos or imagery you have. Another project we have um, is the, the ELB program. And that is basically, um, it's called an electronic logbook. And it basically is a, a measure based on the vessel activity of effort. And it's very important, um, those data in all stock assessments. Uh, key component in the council's red snapper rebuilding plan. While we have observers out on boats, we have CMAP that documents um, the abundance of, of juvenile red snappers. We have uh, Moat Marine Labs also using a similar uh, camera video system to document um, the directed reef fish fishery. So we've got both juveniles and, uh, and adults. For the ELB program, <clears throat> there was uh, currently 500, excuse me, 605 federal permitted vessel holders for shrimp, uh, which are required to carry an ELB. And um, what it basically does, it's a timestamp global positioning system unit that records and stores a vessel's location every 10 minutes. When it's uh, non-roaming and uh, in, within cellular range, it downloads those data to servers. And then basically from these tracks um, that we depict, uh, the locations of vessel speed can be determined or estimated used on uh, the vessel's activity, whether it's on anchor, towing, or moving between towing points. So um, basically we can estimate the fishing effort for a given trip and then apply that to landings data uh, to get catch premium effort. Uh, for for the trip for the trip at various fishing locations. Right now, the uh, 3G cellular service is being replaced um, by 4G, and um, they will the test the ELB units will have to be switched out for those folks that have them now. Um, we're looking at other um, art alternatives such as the. Automatic identification systems, or AAS, which are required to on, on vessels of a certain size, and they basically uh, track the here we go. Um, they they track the vessel. And originally, AAS was solely <clears throat> uh, required and used for collision uh, avoidance purposes. But now, there are a lot of other folks are seeing 
those data are very useful for other for other applications. There's basically the uh, the three G. Yeah. <laughs> this is, pardon me. The three G, um, the AIS, and the four G. And what we're hoping is that the AIS will will uh, be be um, be functional. Oh my God. Okay, this is a track uh, showing the, the ELB, data, ELB data that we have now. And um, the data we received um, from the AS system. And it's showing it's, it's a, a good comparison, but there's a lot of um, missing uh, data points on, on the AIS unit. Uh, that could be satellite. I, I, we're trying to determine that now. Again, another plot um, of the electron logbook versus the AIS system. Another project we have in the Gulf of Mexico is a platform removal observer program. Um, it's basically to monitor for sea turtles and marine mammals. And what they do is they, the oil companies are required However, recently I've heard uh, different, different uh, comments, but they have been required uh, by law that if that uh, platform is no longer producing, it has to be removed. So um, basically we send observers out and they board the salvage boats or another vessel and observe the waters for uh, marine mammals and turtles prior to detonation. Following detonation, they then uh, are perform aerial surveys and helicopters <coughs> excuse me, to detect the presence of species in, in around in the impact zone around the platform. Again, same concept, uh, develop AI ML software to identify these species. Um, the the um, long-term goal is to always have the observers there, but, but um, use drones, um, unmanned automated vehicles uh, equipped with video cameras instead of more expensive helicopters at that time as well as the safety associated with, with um, helicopters, humans. Phase one, again, very similar to the other projects, is to construct an image library, photos and videos of target marine species. And phase two is to develop a detector system or basically the, the um, ALML, AIML. This is um, really boils down to the whole concept is you're taking uh, imagery of, of the fish of interest. Uh, in this case, it's halibut. It's like uh, Cindy Crawford, a fish here. They take every image uh, uh, fathomable up to, I've heard up to 500,000 to a million images um, for one fish uh, species. This is just beyond cool to be here. This, is, uh, this was developed on um, Alaska Fishery Science Center. And um, the whole progression of, of um, AIML was, was um, by now the Galveston Laboratory Director, Farron Wallace. Um, he was very instrumental in, in uh, doing this work. This is showing, uh, um, again, protected species composition monitoring in a processing plant. And the, the target that they've trained the algorithm to detect is salmon. So everywhere it's drawn a box, a red box around uh, a fish that is uh, salmon. 
I believe it's called Hovenot, sure. Um, and the, they trained, this is early on, early uh, concept, proof of concept or truth of concept in the, in the um, AI ML and they trained uh, the model with approximately 6,000 pictures or annotations, imagery uh, of salmon. They trained that. Um, the validation, you have to tell the, the model as well, the algorithm. Um, this, is, this is a Coke <laughs> and uh, that is water. So you have to do to a smaller degree annotations on the other species it will, will um, encounter. In this test, um, the, the folks taking the salmon off the chute uh, calculated or obtained 1,326 salmon, and the algorithm was able to detect 928 salmon, so a recall rate of, of approximately 70%. It's dramatically improved since that time. And again, the key to it all is constantly updating your algorithm, new photos, annotations, so forth. It's the last slide, and I'll, I'll uh, entertain questions as well, um, but there's like 300 fish, so I'll keep talking and ask for questions. But this is phenomenal in my mind. Um, this is uh, a long line boat on the, the west coast and they're targeting for one to assess halibut. And so the, the um, crew member or captain, what have you, he is de-hooking uh, from a, a fish de-hooker rail, very interesting, um, sharks as they come up, and um, releasing the halibut, uh, undersized halibut or not of, not of um, the size that they're targeting. Eventually, they'll they'll <clears throat> he'll retain a, a, a keeper halibut. So with that, <coughs> excuse me. Oh. If you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Any questions? <clears throat> so this is this is cool stuff for sure. I know this. It the software. It looks like it's come a long way in just being able to identify things quickly in a moving video. Um, and in this case, an application on a commercial boat where you've got a a point where the fish are coming on the boat and you can fix a camera works well. Do you, do you see this adapting easily or well to like a recreational type fishery where you have multiple anglers fishing at all different angles around the boat? Or is that still a challenge? I, I, think, I think it could quite, quite possibly uh, be used for uh, the camera mounted uh, on, a, on a recreational boat. And again, um, Mo Marine Lab uh, we are collaborating with them. Uh, they're building a huge imagery library of all the reef fish that they've encountered, which is a giant step forward in the whole process. So I, I think it, it definitely could be applied. It, it's, it's really great because, uh, you know, the challenge in the past has been you know, you collect all this video and then someone's got to read it all. <laughs> but with this, I mean, yeah, you could really cut down on the, you know, the labor intensiveness of, of a project like that, especially if you need multiple cameras right. around the boat. That's really neat. Yeah, and just the time it takes um, for, for folks to review, um, I, I forget the number, I don't even want to guess. For on um, the shrimp boats or shrimp vessels we had, um, that was a, a large component of the cost was just having them review the, the video. 
have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. I, it, I would say yes. Again, Farron would be the, the main man here. But um, um, yes, it does. It, it, and it can take measurements, but I'm not sure of, of exactly the whole process there. In the example with the salmon, mm -hmm. Um, can you adjust the probability of a correct ID? For example, I mean, I'm assuming it was 100%. Um, it, it was assuming it was 100%, and said, but it, can you adjust the, the logic to say maybe I'm 75% certain that that was a salmon? Yes, um, in, a, in another uh, uh, paper I read or, or, or some sort of literature that, that when the box draws around it, it does have a probability um, of, of, you know, 50% uh, sure. Um, and what was really, I was reading up on it before I came here, fascinating was what, what you see and what the computer sees. And, and um, they used the example of a dog or a cat and repeated uh, training. But what the computer sees is the matrix of numbers, and and it's doing all the the uh, calculations when it sees the object. So it's it, it it gives you you know you're looking at a dog and it'll give you you know I'm eighty percent sure this is a dog, um, eight percent confident, and you know ten sure ten percent sure or. or confident that that it's not a cat so if everything you trained it to to key in on eventually it'll give you um, a probability associated with that thank you any additional questions all right thanks appreciate it thank you for your time yeah, thank you Next, we're going to have Dr. Steve Morawski. He's going to talk about the advanced technology approaches to quantifying reef fish and sea turtle abundance and habitat types on the West Florida Show. So it looks like I'm standing between uh, everybody and lunch, so uh, try to do this efficiently. Uh, thanks to Dave and to Jeff and to Darren for putting this session together. Uh, you know, I know all these people have been talking, but you know, it's really great to have them get in a room and actually discuss this. You know, technology moves so quickly, it's hard to keep up with, with, with what's going on. So I wanted to tell you a little story about how I got involved in all of this. Um, prior to being an academic, I worked for Elizabeth and, and Roy's organization, NIMS, and uh, I was involved in fishery stock assessment, like many of the people in this room. And uh, so traditional fishery stock assessment, obviously, is counting up the dead bodies and having some kind of tuning indices, right? So um, as most people in this room have done when they had little children, um, got invited to bring your parent to school day, right? And so I think I went to the second grade with my, one of my daughters. And um, so I was figuring, how, how can I tell these people what I actually do? So finally it struck me. So I put on my wet gear, right? I got a bunch of uh, stuffed fish models and a handful of otoliths. And I went there and I said, I'm a dead fish counter. And that was cool, right? So we went through all kinds of questions about how you catch them and what do you do with them. And right at the end of it, one little girl in the back puts her hand up very tentatively. She says, why do you only count the dead ones? And honestly, you know, it was like, uh, you know, uh, unencumbered by dogma, right? You know, it was the perfect question to ask. And, and this was a long time ago. This is 30 years ago. And it's always haunted me that, you know, our paradigm basically puts a lot of stock in counting the dead ones. Uh, what if we actually counted the live ones and, and in their habitat and those kinds of things? So, so that um, actually translated to when I was... Um, in charge of actually uh, allocating funding, which many of the panel are doing, um, you know, how do you change the paradigm of fish counting? And so the example I have is um, 
the stock assessment for Atlantic sea scallops it used to be based on uh, towing an eight foot wide dredge, a survey dredge, and this was through three generations of research vessels. But eventually, um, NIMS started to buy big ones like the Pisces and up, up north, um, the, the Henry Bigelow, a thousand ton vessel. And I said, I'll be damned if I'm going to put an eight foot wide scallop dredge on a thousand ton vessel. Uh, certainly, we had lots of problems with the veracity of that stock assessment and endless debates about the efficiency of an eight foot wide um, scallop dredge in terms of making actual biomass estimates. Is the efficiency 10%, is it 40%, is it 90%, right? Um, this actually is similar to the Red Snapper debates here in the, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico for how political it was. So um, people at Huey were fooling around with a towed camera system called Habcam. And I said, look, and this is when I was in DC, I said, look, um, we're going to actually do that as a stock assessment thing. And um, it, it took a, a lot of pushing and a lot of uh, dangling money to actually do it. And now that stock assessment is transferred from basically an eight foot wide scallop dredge to a towed camera system. And there are no debates about the efficiency of a scallop dredge, right? Uh, the only issue there is, are you looking at a dead scallop or a live scallop, right? That's really hard to kind of detect. But so <laughs> what they do is they, hire a commercial vessel to tow that eight foot wide scallop dredge so you dump them on the, uh, the deck and you figure out which ones are live or dead. So when I got to the Gulf of Mexico and, and uh, finished with NIMS, I, I shamelessly said, look, I think we can rip off the same design and count reef fish with it. And so, uh, so that's kind of led this path. And so, so what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the projects that we've been uh, using to to use towed cameras along with um, imaging the bottom to try to come up with absolute abundance measures for, um, for reef fishes. Let me get this right, yes. So um, this, obviously the scope of the problem on the, on, in, in the Gulf of Mexico and certainly in the West Florida Shelf, um, they occur uh, on these carbonate reefs. Um, they are difficult to sample with traditional gears like, uh, like CMAP trawling surveys and, and, uh, and, and hooks and, and other devices. Uh, currently, um, there's a fairly substantial uh, program with baited uh, camera systems that can actually ha uh, sample in these habitats. But with baited camera systems, you can't get an absolute abundance measure or it's difficult because you have to understand the zone of attraction to a baited thing. And so there's, there's these debates. So our, uh, our uh, uh, target sampling group is a whole variety of these reef fish species that you see, and including sea turtles. Um, good. So it, the, the challenges of using towed um, uh, gear are these. Um, first of all, you've got this issue of whether you're attracting animals to a towed system or they're avoiding it. And uh, uh, you, you'll see from some of the imagery, I'll show you that uh, uh, when we went into this, we figured, you know, are we going to see any animals at all? The answer is yes, there's attraction and yes, there's avoidance and it kind of depends on the species. Um, the visibility of the water. This is um, the major determinant in whether or not um, uh, optical methods can, can work and, and this is a point that Kevin brought up. Um, the Gulf of Mexico is a real challenge. Um, some, of, some of the Gulf of Mexico is highly visible, um, particularly on the uh, lower part of the West Florida Shelf, down in the Keys. Uh, other parts are really challenging, like off the Mississippi River, and then off Texas, you've got this nephloid layer that um, happens to be exactly in the part of the water column that we want to look in, right? So, so that's a challenge, and so there's a seasonality to the utility of that. Um, obviously, trying to calibrate the view. If you have a moving camera, it's moving at different um, heights off the bottom, so you have to actually figure out the geometry of the fixed camera and then incorporate a, uh, an observing function, that is a detection function, uh, in terms of calibrating a density estimate, which is a number per uh, sampled area, right? So that, that's the controlling piece. Um, one of the things that we found out really quickly in terms of my education about reef fish is that they're on hard bottom habitat, mostly. And so where's the hard, hard bottom habitat? Well, those maps really don't exist in any synoptic way. And so, so are we kind of trapped in this do loop of, geez, if we had a good map, maybe we could do this or not. And so this is why we've actually gone on parallel tracks to number one, develop the observing system, the cam camera optical system, but also develop 
um, and, and actually uh, um, uh, use the, uh, the multi-B mapping software to, to uh, map more of the West Florida Shelf and also try to understand the geological underpinnings of, of why things are where. Obviously, um, one of the uh, important aspects of this is it's not just an acoustic system, but also um, you get a lot of leverage if you use water column sonar as well. Um, this was, again, one of the issues that Kevin talked about. Um, if you're um, assessing herring in Prince William Sound, you know it's a herring school, and there's some odd things that are in it. If you have a reef fish complex where you could have 200 different species, it's a much more challenging issue to try to tease out what exactly you're looking at. And it's probably not a, a desirable outcome to say, we have a big ball of reef fish here, right? You know, obviously some are managed and some are not. And so the challenge of, of actually combining these technologies, which are quite complementary, uh, is important. And in the case of red snapper, the notion of uh, stacking, that is um, in some uh, high relief habitats, you get them way above the camera. And so um, the, the two technologies then become complementary. Um, as Elizabeth showed, um, there's a whole realm of auto processing of vi video imagery. Um, I'm wearing out graduate student eyes at this point, uh, counting things on videos, and so we've invested a bit in auto processing of, of these. Um, this is a very difficult challenge of, uh, uh, of sampling and identifying a moving animal from a moving platform. And when you think about it, um, that's exactly what the military does. Um, you know, when you do things like detection of friend or foe when you're flying an aircraft. And so um, our uh, uh, collaborators have been from uh, basically the military side of things. Uh, and then um, this was mentioned early in the first talk we had, and, and that's a concept of operations. You know, I'll show you some smaller scale, you know, um, applications of, of this method, but how do you make an economical survey? out of something like this. And so, so you know, West Florida Shelf is 200,000 square kilometers, right? So how in a two week or three week or, or month long cruise can you hope to have enough sampling effort to actually get the signal from the noise? And so this, this whole concept of operations of merging these technologies becomes, becomes important. So I hope you, I haven't dissuaded you from the fact that we can actually do this, right? So, so um, we have had a program uh, for the last um, four years funded by NIFWIF, um, uh, and, and this is based on settlement money from the deep water. And so we've, we've, um, we've mapped about 2,700 square kilometers of the West Florida Shelf, which sounds like a lot, but it's about 2%, we're one um, and a half percent. But the nice thing about multi-beam mapping is it's cumulative, right? So, so we're, we're chipping away at it. We want to assess the relative density and the absolute abundance of fishes and sea turtles that are on this mapped habitat. And so that's actually one of the biggest challenges. And of course, this relates directly to stock assessment. But we also want to uh, obviously provide this uh, information to the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council, to NIMS, and to the states. And one of the um, outcomes of this, and, and this has been a challenge uh, trying to work with the NIF with money, which is mostly habitat restoration money. Um, that is um, to try to develop new technologies and actually envision how we would potentially go from a system we have now to a, a, another system, all right, that uh, maybe is more precise and more timely. And then um, one of the other things that we wanted to do, and this is where we got the geologists involved, is to identify promising areas where we think there's hard bottom habitat to be um, mapped. And uh, so these would be high priority in terms of uh, understanding the species interactions uh, with that habitat, things like red snapper and groupers on the west floor. So, so uh, just to make the point here, um, this is um, all of uh, NOAA's holdings on the, on the left-hand side in terms of um, where uh, mapping data reside. And you can see that the area of the West Florida Shelf is pretty depauperate in terms of you know, identified mapping projects. And ironically, the deep part of the Gulf is actually better, has better map. And this is because Bohm had a project where they took, um, they asked the oil companies to give them the seismic data. Well, they, out, they have to give them seismic data. They stripped off these sub-bottom profiles and got a really nice bathymetry off of it, right? So, so we have this irony that you know the deeper Gulf is actually uh, has a better map than than the shallower parts of the Gulf, and so this it really creates you know this 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 issue, right? 
So uh, in terms of uh, identifying areas where we wanted to map, um, there are a number of places that have been mapped uh, previously, um, particularly the HAPCs that exist there, um, at, uh, the uh, um, Florida Middle Grounds, the, the Steamboat Lumps, Madison Swanson, uh, an area f a bit farther north um, here that's been mapped, and, and, and a few others, um, particularly down south. So, our work has been basically trying to tie these areas together, particularly the steamboat lumps in the middle grounds. And then we've worked in an area um, directly off of Tampa called the Elbow. Um, the reason we wanted to try to connect these areas up is uh, we're trying to uh, understand the underlying geological processes that give rise to hard bottom habitat. And so I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, the other, um, what I consider to be the treasure map of hard bottom uh, habitat is the VMS data that come from the reef fish fishers. Now, VMS are required um, for all reef fish fishers, and so if you look at the raw VMS, it just is kind of a, you know, every place has a reef fish boat, but, but when you subtract out the, uh, the steaming as opposed to the fishing things, you get basically these uh, hot spots of, uh, of reef fish activity. So you can see why we actually wanted to map this area here because there's a lot of reef fish fishing that goes on here, over here, down in this area, et cetera. And so, so in a very real sense, if you were gonna start de novo, um, using that in some kind of uh, machine learning uh, thing to understand what you have, understand what you know, basic bathymetry you have and, and trying to locate that, I think is a really, really good way to start. So um, the things that we did to, to do basically the, the, the toad video is we, we um, repurposed a tow frame that, um, uh, that this um, left hand image is. Uh, the tow frame actually was um, originally built for a video plankton recorder project that the University of South Florida had. So that wasn't currently ongoing. So but what we did was we started hanging a bunch of cameras off the front and sides. And so right now the current configuration has six cameras. Two of them are in stereo, the other four are to, to try to cover uh, about a 180 degree angle, you know, so when you're towing the thing along. It has a bunch of sensors, the most important of which is the, um, is the altimeter, right? So, you know, the point is you don't want to crash this thing into the bottom. Uh, the ideal, uh, f you know, flying height is about three to five meters off the bottom, depending on the water visibility. It has a number of other attributes as well. Damn it. I'll get this yet. Um, the little ball here is, uh, if you actually part this thing off, it parts as well and the ball comes up to the surface. We've lost it twice and we've got it back twice, actually. Um, Florida Middle Grounds is a, sorry, the uh, steam, uh, the Madison Swanson is a very difficult place to actually do this kind of work. So if you look at how this actually operates, um, what we try to do is actually um, do the multi-B map first and then come back and do the, the cruise with the, uh, with the, uh, the camera at second. And the reason is, if you've got a very high relief um, area that you know, you're, you're gonna need to jump over, it's always better to know that's coming as opposed to 30 seconds from disaster, right? So, so that's the kind of the way this works. One of the challenges, of course, is that the, the camera is, is behind the vessel and depending on the water depth, it, you know, basically uh, ha you have a longer scope. So when you're actually trying to geo-reference everything, you need to figure out what the layback is uh, from the vessel in order to actually match up the multi-beam directly with the, the video imagery, right? And so um, there are a number of ways to do that. There's a layback equation. Um, there are also uh, sonars that we've used back and forth to try to track it. They don't work that great, you know. Um, actually, the layback equation works pretty well. And so, so the whole concept of this is there's a first pass mapping uh, and there are a couple of different vessels that can do this. In fact, many vessels can do that. Um, the, the important aspect of the camera system is that um, uh, it's powered by the CTD cable that comes down, right? So that's a, that's a um, you basically got three wires and, and the, uh, the steel jacket. So what we can do is bring power down to the, uh, the vehicle. And so we don't have these power constraints like you would with an autonom autonomous vehicle or, or even to a certain extent um, ROVs. So we're sending like 750 volts down to 
the, um, the vehicle from the CTD cable, and that powers all the instruments. And as well, we can send a low resolution video back up the, uh, the cable so you can actually see where it is in real time. And so in a, in a real sense, what we're doing is flying, flying the vessel. So this is um, basically one of the monitors uh, uh, at, on the ship, and so what you're looking at is a, a range of video that's coming up, and you can switch between the six cameras to see what's going on, and then all of the other um, instruments that are on, like the altitude, et cetera, and so, so in a real sense, you can fly the, the vehicle. Um, it doesn't mean we don't bump into the bottom periodically, but nevertheless. Uh, so one of the uh, critical issues, of course, is where's the no-fly zone in terms of the visibility of the water? And these are images that we've collected from around the Gulf. I mean, th you know, this is totally undetectable. These are actually pretty good images, you know, in terms of uh, the Gulf. And so, so in terms of concept of operations, you don't want to send the, um, the ships out there, you know, with the cameras and basically find, you know, anything in the top row. I mean, you're just wasting your time. So one of the things that we're thinking about is sending out an ROV, you know, with, a, with basically a CDOM sensor. You know, or or a glider, and so if if in fact you know there's a critical sea dom level that you know we can do this work, then send the ships out to do that. So I think in terms of actually figuring out the the, the right um, uh, window of opportunity, you know that that would be a major aspect of this. So uh, as well um, with the um, you know as we're towing the the. The vehicle along, we're, we're taking a EK60 or EK80 water column sonar, and so there are a whole variety of metrics that we can derive from a typical image. Now, as as Kevin said, um, there's a real problem with what we would call the dead zone, right, around around the sea bottom, and that is, um, you know, what what exists there versus you know what what can you actually insonify? In this case, you've got a number of of species, the larger fish. Um, you know, this is a pretty good image. Um, you've got um, microzooplankton uh, in in the water column. Um, you've got the sea floor, and that, you know that's a hard stop. Uh, and then you've got um, the hard bottom substrate, and that is you know you can have a veneer over the top. Um, and then you've got a variety of schooling fishes. The complementary aspect of of doing the um, the the uh, sonar as well as the um, the cameras, if you can match, georeference them, basically what you have is an additive thing, right? So the camera's coming along, and it's coming along at a height like this, and it's looking downwards, right? So it's looking into the acoustic dead zone. So, but it can't see what it can't see. You know, it can't see anything above the height of the camera unless, and we've tried to point cameras straight up. It's kind of interesting, you get silhouettes of fish and all that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, you put the, the imagery together, number one, you, you've got the species composition. Right, which is incredibly helpful in terms of actually doing that. And you've got some uh, shot at actually the size uh, of the animals as well. And so, so um, they, they really are kind of additive uh, technologies. This is the backscatter scale. So I wanted to show you um, uh, the results of some of the mapping. Now, now this was the uh, Florida Middle Grounds map that David Narr um, uh, uh, had collected, um, it took about six years to actually get this together, and this is one of the HAPCs that the council has. So we extended that to try to see what these geological features look like. So I just wanted to show you what that map is. And so um, the video starts down here, and we're tracing right up this feature. Now, um, what the geologists tell us is that this feature is actually um, a, um, a sea level stand from, you know, the last... Uh, um, uh, ice Age, basically about 12,000 years ago. And so actually a lot of the features on the West Florida Shelf are these, these north to south features, which are these sea level stands. And in fact, um, I'll show you a, a, a image in just a second, um, but basically we think that the ridge is actually a lithified sand dune. Um, uh, because of the carbonate nature of the sand here, it actually lithifies relatively quickly. So, so that gives us some clue. Number one, if you're, you're going to start looking at these features, um, it's, it's really important to maybe look at the low resolution bathymetry and follow the features that, you know, from areas that we are actually started to work on. So this is uh, some imagery from, the, uh, from uh, crossing this um, hard um, surface. Um, a lot of times we were using these black and white cameras, and that what we find is that they, you can get a lot more... Um, 
definition. They're much more high definition than color cameras. Um, and ironically, these are the cameras that um, you get the ticket in the mail, you know, from uh, going through a stoplight. They're really good because they can blow up your license plate. So what you're seeing is a hard bottom uh, ridge and then the sand and other features on the other side, um, some fish in here. Good. So one of the other uh, interesting features of the West Florida Shelf, we have just one pipeline, right? So it's the Gulf Stream pipeline, which uh, uh, goes from Mobile, Alabama to Tampa Bay. And uh, one of the things we wanted to do was um, because um, the great red snapper count um, wanted to look at red snapper on pipelines, particularly in the Western Gulf, we, we worked out a way to actually fly along the pipelines. And so um, this has been one of our targets for quite a while. Let me see if I can get it to play. Yes. So this is a three foot wide pipe, right? And then on the outsides, originally they wanted to try to bury this. And so they used a plow dredge to try to see if they could create a, you know, a trench and put the pipeline in. Well, um, there was such a thin veneer of sand over the top of this that really what they have is a rubble pile on each side. But you can see that there's a tremendous amount of, of fish, um, fish biomass and a big species diversity along the pipeline. And this is probably why um, you go out there on a Saturday morning and it's just, pe just a recreational fisheries. It's pretty much a, a, a desert, you know, in and around the pipeline. But some pretty nice, uh, pretty nice fish along here. There's uh, some skates and red snapper and a few others. Yeah. So um, this is the alternative. This is uh, what a lot of the West Florida shelf looks like. It's sand bottom, intermittent. You've got these small grouper holes and other things. And so you can see that they're, they're, it's like a desert, but you have these small oases of fish. Uh, it's not like you've got these emergent coral reefs that you see uh, that your mind image says, that, you know, like down in the Keys. It's really a much uh, more subtle habitat in terms of the mapping. Lots of angelfish out on the West Florida shelf, and just a whole variety of things. Right. Porgies. Yeah. So one of the things that you can see is um, uh, f this is a, a lower resolution image, and you can the reason you can see that is because you can see the uh, the laser light. You know, if it was clear water, you'd never see the light. You know, so uh, fair enough. Um, uh, obviously, there's um, a, a variety of species there as well. One of the things that um, is evident in a lot of these videos is that um, you, you generally see the fish on the video before they actually detect the presence of the camera and move to it. And so one of our greatest fears was that, you know, basically we wouldn't see anything. Um, uh, for most species, and I'll, I'll reserve gag grouper and vermilion snapper, uh, for most species, by the time um, the camera image gets to them, and we're towing it about four knots, um, uh, you've already been able to ensonify them. So these are, those are uh, amberjacks there. Okay. So, so one of the things that we wanted to do is combine the, um, the um, imagery from the cameras with the um, multi-beam sonar um, to try to see if we could get habitat stratified abundance measures, right? So we selected this place called the Elbow, which is a very popular fishing spot off of, um, off, off of Tampa. It's about 87 square kilometers. And one of the things that we found is that, so what we did was we did a, a, a multi-beam map, and we've actually since then extended it. And we also did a bunch of uh, camera transects. So there's a, a vertical transect uh, across this, um, this um, uh, ridge that, that runs north-south. And then we did a variety of, of, of toes through that to see if we could um, see if we could sample all the habitats that are on there. And so with the multi-beam, you get two, two, base, two derivatives, right? You get the bathymetry map, which this is, and then you also get the backscatter map. And the backscatter is pretty much the hardness and the rugosity of uh, not only the surficial geology, but to a certain extent, the subsurface geology as well. If you've got a really hard rock there, it'll come off uh, as, as a hard bottom area. So the question is, um, if we can only um, use the cameras for 1%, say, of the, actually put you know, eyeballs on 1% of that, can we come up with an algorithm that takes the entire area that we multi-beam, the 87 kilometers, uh, and uh, applies some kind of model to say, all right, because of all these bathymetric characters, and we've correlated them with the, the habitat types, can we actually um, expand that to the hap not only the bathymetry, but the habitat types that exist in the larger area, right? 
So, so, um, so I've had a student, Alex Illich, who um, has has done a lot of this um, work, and what we're the whole enterprise is called surrogacy. That is, can you find a surrogate in the multi-beam data that actually is a surrogate for a particular habitat type? So from the um, from the uh, bat bathymetry, there are a whole variety of metrics one can derive. Um, the curvature and the relative position, obviously the depth, the rugosity, and that is, you know, for a given uh, length, you know, how much turning angle do you have in, in, in terms of the bathymetry? Um, the orientation, that is the east and the westness of it. And then, of course, the first derivative or the slope. All right, so there's a lot of derivative metrics that you can get from the bathymetry. In the same way, there's a whole variety of, of derivative metrics that you can get from the, uh, um, from the uh, backscatter. And they, they include these uh, GLCMs, the gray level co-occurrence matrices. And so you can, you can basically look at you know, how, how dark the imagery is, the amount of contrast, the amount of entropy, and that is basically from pixel to pixel, is it continuous or d does it jump around quite a bit? And so whole class on this one, but uh, nevertheless, um, what you can do is take the bathymetry and the backscatter metrics and then the terrain attributes, right, which are basically the backscatter metrics and the texture metrics, which are basically the, the backscatter derivatives, and see if you can uh, correlate those with the areas that you actually had eyeballs on, right? So remember, this is a tricky thing because, you know, the camera's, you know, 100 yards behind the boat, right? And so there's a lot of... Uh, of uh, you know what, how big a pixel can you actually make and be accurate about it? But uh, so nevertheless, um, and this is really interesting. Um, if we're trying to predict um, a habitat attribute, um, it, the 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 different variables are different depending on the 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 area that you're actually looking at. So the elbow is kind of a flat relief, you know, with a with a hard spine. The Florida middle grounds is much more. Um, it has much steeper bathymetry, right? So the bathymetry becomes much more important in the Florida middle grounds. And then the, this is the southwest Florida middle grounds, which is kind of in between. And so you can see that the, the kinds of variables that um, uh, uh, result in increasing accuracy, right, if you remove them, uh, are different from the different areas. And so not one model fits all things equally well, which is another issue. So what we've been able to do is not only do the, what we call supervised classification of the areas that we've actually done in the project, but we've also been able to go back and look at all the other multi-beamed areas, for example, this one, the Florida Middle Grounds, and, and even to a certain extent, Pulley Ridge, and divide them in this case into a simple, um, you know, a relatively crude metric. It's either rock or sand. Now, there are a whole variety of intermediate mixed um, areas, et cetera, but understanding where there's rock and where there's sand is pretty important because that seems to be the, the thing that the reef fish are orienting on, right? And so we've, we've actually been able to go back and do that using this supervised classification algorithm. And so if, um, if you do that, then this is what the elbow looks like, right? Um, hard bottom ridge, but mostly sand. This is what the Southwest Florida middle grounds looks like. Um, a really, this, these pieces actually fit together, as I said before. And this is what Florida middle grounds look like. It's really, really very steep in many of those places. So, so now that we sort of uh, can take each pixel and classify it into its habitat type, we can also count up the fish that we saw in the video. And so, so what we have here are a series of density measures, right? So here's a bunch of different species. So this is, um, this is all fish. Um, this is blue angel fish and, and uh, big eyes, uh, porgies. Um, I'm trying to read that. Got my glasses on. Uh, and then uh, snappers and, and other things as well. And so what you see is really interesting, of course, is really high densities in the rock and generally really low densities in, uh, on the sand. Now, now, this is sand tilefish, so you're gonna see more density on the sand. Um, interestingly, in terms of this whole area, um, three and a half kilometers of that would be classified as rock, and uh, 83.6 80, would be classified under this model as sand. And so, so the question is, if you multiply the density of the animals times the area, right, what does the absolute population abundance look like? 
And that's what these are. So the purple is basically the population abundance in the entire region. And the, the red represents the population abundance on the three and a half kilometers of rock as opposed to the 83 kilometers of, uh, of sand. And so you can see some really interesting, in, interesting things, right, in terms of, you know, the different species. And, and overall, you know, half, you know, if you look at this graphic up here, right, half the uh, species abundance are located on 4% of, uh, of the habitat. So imagine if you had that habitat map and you could do this for basically the entirety of the West Florida Shelf. That would be kind of the dream. Uh, and so um, uh, the algorithm should work, right? And so the question would be, uh, is it efficient to do that? And then how far are we away from having a reasonable habitat map? Good question. Right? I don't have to answer them, I just have to ask them, right? Um, so the other thing I want to talk about very quickly is sea, uh, sea turtles. And so there are a number of different, uh, you probably can't read this uh, uh, table, but um, so there are different uh, areas being surveyed, uh, Florida Middle Grounds, um, Madison Swanson, uh, Steamboat Lumps, and this is the Gulf Stream Pipeline. So uh, the bottom line is the vast majority of, of turtles that we've seen have been on the Gulf Stream pipeline. In fact, the, 30, the turtles are 37 times more abundant on the pipeline than they were on the natural habitat, which I guess argues that we need to make the pipeline a HAPC. No. That was a joke, that was a joke. Right. So, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, you know, we, we need, you know, because the pipeline is attracting so much recreational fishing effort, we really need to be cognizant of potential for bycatch out there, right? And, and the, honestly, the commercial longliners, I don't know whether, uh, yeah, the depth should be that they can actually, they can actually go along that pipeline and string their, their long lines along it. And so we need to make sure that we're careful about that because that's a potential bycatch hotspot. Uh, the, the other piece of this, which is really fascinating to me because I'm not a geologist, is what's, what, you know, what's the geologic uh, framework you know, that we're trying to sample in? So this is, um, this is a, a project that we worked on. Um, so if you see these tracks, we had a, uh, a low-scale um, uh, uh, seismic um, uh, device called a bubble gun. It's not, it's not the big seismic shooting that you, know, you do for oil rigs, but basically makes a pop, popping sound, right? So, so what we were able to do is go across some of these features. And in the elbow region in particular, so we did these transects to try to understand what's, what's right at the, the surface and then what the, the, the subsurface is. And so, so you can see um, down to a few meters, you know, what, what actually underlies these things. And again, this is an interpreted map from the geologists, but you can see this lithified sand dune as being really important. And then you can see how very thin the sediment layer is over the top. And then this is basically the, the, um, the, the longer term geolo geological surface that's there. So, you know, this is sort of the more recent geology. Uh, and this really gives us some um, ability to prospect for where we think other important habitats may lie on the West Florida Shelf. And so here's, here's a, a number of things that we'd like to see done. So if you, if you look at the low resolution bathymetry that we have for the West Florida Shelf, you see these sort of cul-de-sacs and, and they exist all the way along. Well, that's exactly what the Southwest Florida Middle Grounds is. It's one of these cul-de-sacs, which um, is a, an old barrier island. So we really think that um, by, by just tracing these things along, we, we can find a lot more of this high-valued habitat just because of what we think the bathymetry is actually doing there, right? So there are uh, these continuous paleo shorelines. Um, there's what we consider to be isolated barrier islands, um, the spits like the elbow. Um, then there are some offshore banks like the Florida Middle Grounds, which seems kind of rare. Um, if you look at the bathymetry up here, this is probably something of importance, you know, given the rugosity of the bathymetry up here. Uh, and then there's these mounds and pinnacles, which uh, there are a number of places called, you know, it seems like everything's called the sticky grounds, right? But those are geological features which uh, um, are going to be extremely difficult to, uh, to, to sample, certainly with the optic technology. So the other um, part of this, and I'll, I'll shut up here in a minute, is um, uh, kind of a takeoff on what Liz just talked about in terms of um, AI. Uh, again, uh, what, we're, what we're doing is uh, counting the fish uh, in terms of species identification in, uh, uh, along one minute segments and actually dividing it into 15 second segments to get the density estimates. Uh, and that's a very laborious thing to do. And so 
we've had a partnership with SRI International, which is a group in Princeton, uh, New Jersey, and they are the inventors of HDTV, and they, they do a lot with the military, and so um, we brought this question to them, and so uh, it's sort of the same thing. Let me see if I can get this to play. Can you, can you can you get that to play? Yeah. So w what it's doing is, um, you know, obviously if we're moving along and we're trying to track fish, it's a much more difficult problem than tracking fish at the side of the boat. What it's doing is, um, it's all these little squares are quote propo proposals, right? So the, the, the computer is basically identifying something that's out of the ordinary and is writing these thumbnails to a file. So this is a trainable system. So you, you basically um, what you can say is, no, that's not a this, that's a that, you know? And so over uh, about three or four iterations, we can train this not only to the habitat features, but also the fish. And when you, when you see fish come into this, you can see it's actually tracking them and so one of the things we want to make sure is we don't double count the, the species. And so this is a couple iterations away from going uh, live. And we have the idea of uh, basically looking at uh, how many cumulative passes do we actually need to, to get to sort of a, a reasonable confidence interval, whether it's 75% or 95%, et cetera. Um, this will revolutionize this kind of uh, uh, approach. Um, we can keep the cameras in the water for 20 hours a day. Right, and so I mean, if you're going at four knots, I mean, that's an enormous amount of uh, of, of data to process. So even if there's an error rate, uh, it's probably a consistent error rate of the computer. And one of the questions that we have is, uh, do we have to tune this for individual habitats, or can we get a cumulative habitat tuning of this for all the habitats in the in the Gulf? And so this is really kind of going full circle, you know, in terms of um, making this. Uh, an operational technology as opposed to an interesting te technology, right? So with that, um, just in terms of next steps, uh, we, um, in, in terms of looking at the geology of the West Florida Shelf, we think there's about 15,000 square kilometers of what we would consider really important habitats. Um, we obviously want to classify the habitats and the biota being surveyed. One of the important aspects of like doing the multi-beam maps is um, you only have to do them once. You know, I'm sure a hurricane may come in and do kinds of, you know, move the sand around or those kinds of things, but it's a, it's a cumulative uh, uh, thing. And so the, the more money we put up front in terms of actually doing this mapping, the more we're going to get to this ability to actually do habitat stratified population estimates with, with whatever technology, right? Um, we want, obviously, archiving these data so the next people around that do these kinds of projects don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel in terms of finding the data. Um, the cross calibration studies, um, we have a couple uh, going with, with NIMS and with uh, Ted's group at, at FWRI to cross calibrate the, the uh, drop cameras with the mobile cameras. And then, you know, certainly um, there's a lot of interest in this throughout the Gulf and, in fact, globally. And so creating some kind of a community of practice where we can share these ideas is really important. So, with that, uh, thanks very much and happy to take any questions. Thanks, Steve. We have about four minutes to lunch, so we have time for a few I did, questions. I did it that way, yeah. <laughs> I just that was very interesting, thank you. I just want to ask you one question that slide you had towards the end uh, where it was mapping, tracking along the bottom. It looked like it was, there was some fish that had come into the, the, the scan of the camera early on, and then later it just looked like almost featureless bottom. Was the color of the rectangles that were being projected by the computer indicative of a particular thing, like whether blue ones fish and the brown ones uh, substrate? That, that's what we were trying to get is, you know, basically so that you could, you could do this. And what, one of the things what we're trying to do is, uh, you know, there, so there's a habitat classification scheme called CMEX, right? And, and what we're trying to actually, and this is um, the federal agency to put this together. So we're thinking about, you know, are there benthic species that actually tell you what the habitat is, right? So if you see a Gorgonian, for example, you know that there's a hard bottom substrate there because it has to attach to something, right? And so, so what we're trying to aim for with that algorithm is not only counting the fish, but actually 
auto classifying the habitat so we don't have to actually go through this rigmarole of, of figuring out what it is. And so, uh, um, yeah, th there are a few issues to iron out. One of them is, are we sure that those fish don't come back around, you know, and, and you know, circling the camera and those kinds of things. I, I'm not sure how we get it, you know, to that unless we have cameras 360 or something like that. Yeah. Might have for one more question. All right, I'll ask one more question. Mm -mm. So you said your tow time is between three and four knots. Right. Is that a predetermined based on some sort of metric you determined? Because it, it looked like it was clipping along there pretty fast. Are you capturing everything there, or is it? Can you tow slower or faster? Well, you know, uh, so it's really interesting if you if you watch the video, you don't see the thing swaying very much, and that's because we built these fairings on the side of the tow thing. So so you know you get that sort of you know water pressure through the thing, and it keeps it from yawing quite a bit. If you slow down too much. Um, it, it will start to pit, to yaw on you a little bit, and you know we're primarily interested in relatively large things. Uh, an ROV is going to be much better at looking at the little, little things, right? And so I think you know because we're going three and a half or four knots, we're going to lose our um, uh, precision on the small things, right? So there's a trade-off there of maneuverability, um, and then you know you know for example, this is all you know. This, there's not a uh, uh, AI for the flight of this thing over the bottom. Uh, what, what happens is um, we put out the cable until we see the bottom, and then you know if we're if we're going up in altitude or we need to hop a rock, we basically tell the winch operator to go up a meter or whatever. I mean, ideally, you know, you could put fins on this thing and do that and tow it slower. Um, I think it's a reasonable trade-off though, because if the concept of operations is really to do something on the scale of the shelf, then you, you're going to have to book along and do things and. You know, it's it's faster than a trawl. You know, trawls are generally towed at like two knots or something like that. I'm not sure what CMAP is. It's about two knots, I think. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a trade-off. It's a trade-off. All right. Thank you.